In the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln's Secretary of State bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Barney Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand-selected gear since 1963. The exclusive home of Frontier Gear, built for the rugged Alaskan terrain. Your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Visit Barney's today at 906 West Northern Lights. Arbor Digital, the forefront of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and wealth management. Providing a low-cost, research-based investment strategy for Alaskans looking to invest their hard-earned money. Visit arborcapital.io today to put your money to work. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. TheTreeHouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. The Connoisseur Lounge, Alaska's premier locally owned and operated cannabis retailer, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. Their cultivated products include Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and much more. Find them at theconnoisseurlounge.net. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska, built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation, with exclusive products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce cards, and more. Ask your local bud tender about A. K-O. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older, keep out of the reach of children, and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They're the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Snow Pro AK, your snow and ice management company specializing in business and residential properties. They know what it takes to keep your property presentable and safe. Give them a call for a free estimate at 280-7098 or visit lawnproak.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off of Arctic and 58th handcrafted Alaskan-made colonial ciders. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Stop by today and taste an award-winning cider. Yeah, it seemed like that was, uh, like a lot of things had to come together to make that happen. I mean, you wouldn't have known that if you just showed up. But if you know anything about preparing a venue... Um, especially one of that size, like that had to be really tough. Well, and last minute. Yeah. And they, yeah. Uh, the guy, the guy's really responsible is, is Kevin Kehoe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's kind of Mr. Wild Sheep Foundation in Alaska. He's done it all himself. Is that Kevin Keyhold? Ke- K E H O E. K E H O E. K E H O E. He's the uh, president and CEO, and he's when it started uh, the Alaska chapter after Fanaz fizzled out. Oh, okay. Yeah, he started a new chapter. Oh, cool. Yeah, Yeah, and I mean, that had to be like some blood, sweat, and tears and getting the people together and then the getting the tent up and then yeah. the table. I mean, you would, it was, it felt like a totally normal banquet too. Yeah. <laughs> it was like business as usual, but I bet behind the scenes that had to be. Yeah, it wasn't too tough. I mean, they, tough. they had a, a, a good, um, 
you know, people that uh, prepared the meal did a great job, and uh, mm-hmm. the people put up the tent and got it up plenty of time. And yeah, um, kind of worried about a wind coming up. You know what, Palmer mm-hmm. does the wind sometimes. So. Yeah, it was a beautiful night though. It was. There was no wind. It was bluebird. It was sunny. Um, it was perfect, actually. Yeah, for, what it was. for me, it was uh, after Ed Rasmus got his award. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know Ed or not, but he walked mm-hmm. off the stage in tears. Oh. Ed, is, Ed is probably the most generous guy you'd ever want to talk to, and he's the original sheep fanatic. I mean, back before it was popular, mm-hmm. Ed was a sheep hunter. He's got Marco Polos, our gollies. He's got, a, you know, of course, got his Grand Slam. He's been around the world, done oh, it yeah. all. Mm-hmm. And he's just a generous guy. In fact, he gave uh, uh, Boone and Crockett Club a million dollars to build an education center in mm. uh, Montana. Um, Ed oh, was wow. an extremely generous guy. Wow. Yeah, the hunting community lost a great guy when, when he passed away. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's gotten too popular? I kind of think so. It's, it's kind of, you know, they're going to probably have to go to a permit system. I hate to say that for Alaska, but I don't think it's much choice. Yeah. Mm. You know. what, what do you think is the uh, the main reason or the, why why has it become so popular? You think social media or just more companies? I just think sheep are cool to hunt. I think people discovered that. Uh, what it amounts to up in yeah. the high and lonesome uh, spot in stock, and uh, you know, sheep is kind of the top of the pinnacle yep. as far as you hunting. And so I just think that people discovered that. Yeah, and once you do that, I mean, you're, you're telling all your buddies, you know. And once you go, like, you know, I've t- taken several guys that have never gone, and and. You know, you go and either you're, that's it. You're a sheep hunter for life or yeah. you never want to do it again. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. no middle ground. In or yeah. out. No middle ground. Yeah, sheep hunters are a different breed. I think it is. A, I think it's a combination of a, it's a pretty big movement in hunting in general. Western, Western hunting has like exploded because of the like fitness community has crossed right. over into hunting a lot. And I right. think that mm-hmm. has exploded elk and sheep hunting for sure. I think the other thing that, that exploded too is uh, you know putting wild wild meat in your your freezer. Yeah, co- mm. COVID COVID yeah. blew up hunting. Period. I think. Yeah. Well, period, I think eating, eat, eating healthy, meat. eating organic, um, a yeah. healthy lifestyle. You know that all really kicked into gear. You know, ten years ago. I mean, people that have been into it has been on it, but there's been a bigger light, a bigger light shed on that. Where now it's like, okay, well, how do I uh, get or or produce the best the best possible meat or vegetables and gardening yeah. and all that stuff, and so I think you're right. You know the health factor mm-hmm. and just the meat and the adventure of it all just all yeah. adds up. Well, there's a guy by the name Sean Mahoney. Uh, he hmm. spoke at the National Wild Sheep, and he is into uh, uh, a movement called Natural Harvest, and he had some incredible statistics about wild game, and he's he's trying to meld in the the berry pickers um, with the yeah. uh, uh, with the hunters and uh, you know they're, they're mm. all one according to him, and he had he's done some great work on statistics. He I, I, I'll get this wrong. I have to kind of paraphrase it, but he was saying that uh, when somebody goes to the store and buys some New York steaks, you don't come home and and uh, call your neighbors over and say, "Hey, would you like one of my New York steaks?" Mm. But if you get Definitely a deer not. or a moose or an elk, yeah. you share that. And he had some statistics about. How many people the average person hunter shares with his his relatives, and it was pretty incredible. Um, it was uh, uh, I'm just guessing. I think five or six multiplied, and mm. so you figure that one deer, that one moose, that one caribou. Um, <coughs> it's not just one family; it's a lot of families. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys you hunt. I'm sure you give meat away. Yeah, hell oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's very it's communal. family and loved yeah. ones. For very sure. communal for yeah. sure. And so that's that's uh. An, uh so he's he's done a good job. He's uh, uh, he's got a national movement going, a lot of statistics, and uh, he was a, a great great speaker. I think that's smart of him to lump in the uh, like the berry pickers and things like that. Sometimes people f- might want to put them in a, on a different lane than uh, than the hunters, whereas we're all trying to uh, produce and, and consume. Well, it's all a harvest. It's all a harvest. Yeah, right. whether yeah. it's a wild game animal or um, a fern. That you yeah. make soup or, you know, berries that you pick to make jams. It's it's all a harvest one way or the other, isn't it? Yeah. His, his program calls the, 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 the Natural Harvest Initiative, and he's uh, got a lot of money behind him. I think uh, Fish and Games all over the states donated, uh, Safari Club, Wild Sheep, and nice. he's making some good, re- good headway, kind of getting that theme across to a lot of people. 
That's yeah. awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah. For, foraging is something that I've like really mm. put on my list of like I I need to do more of that. I need I want to learn more of like the things. There's so much ditch asparagus and like the fern heads. Yeah, natural and, like, lattice, There's so much and stuff, stuff in mm-hmm. Alaska that's like well, just the mushrooms alone. Like how many oh, yeah. different uh, ones yeah, are there? Yeah. Well, and I was thinking yeah. about a few minutes ago when we were talking about like uh, John alluded to the the sharing of the meat. I feel like it's like a natural clan, like instinct to like harvest. You know, you get a moose, you get three, four hundred pounds of meat. You get a caribou, you get, you know, one hundred fifty pounds of meat. You get a substantial lump of meat, and it's like, you know, mom, brother, uncle, cousin, you know, grandparents. It just feels like they can't go. You know, a lot of times they don't have the time or, or resources, or or maybe they're too elderly or whatever the case is to go out and do it, even though they would enjoy it. And so you feel like an obligation to share it. And it's just like a, just feels like a clan type natural instinct to share that yeah. harvest it's, with your, with your village, with your people, with your clan, you know, it's tribal for sure. Tribal. That's Super probably, tribal. yeah, I was trying to be PC with that comment, but I think we all like know what I mean by that when you want to just yeah. naturally share that with, with people and it feels good. Right. Mm-hmm. Especially when they call and tell you, man, those burgers are great. <laughs> yeah. You know, those, 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 uh, that backstrap. Oh my God. You know, just, and it's like. I just had my new neighbor come over yesterday. They just, they just moved here from, uh, Utah, originally from North Carolina. And he's a, he's a pilot. And so he wanted to be a bush pilot. So. Perfect. He was, he was telling me that they, uh, literally he was like, told his wife, he's like, I think, I think we should move to Alaska. And he said within one week, they both landed a job bought my neighbor's house sight unseen like just off pictures on the internet and just moved here just and, trusted he, and now he's a bush pilot and she's a teacher and he was like i'm so i'm super excited to like to uh get out and hunt he's like you know i really like to dabble in taxidermy i was like wait hold on so my new neighbor is a <laughs> pilot and he dabbles in taxidermy i was like Okay, if we're gonna get along. Where's the camera? Where's the cameras? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the cameras? And it, I gave him a bunch of meat. He just came over yesterday and thanked me and said how good it was. He's like, I never had moose. It's amazing. Way cool. Yeah, so probably it, like him better if he tells she's gonna buy him a super cub with. A that's what I told him. That's what I told him. I said, Hey, I got gas money if you find a super cub that you, you're interested in. He's like, I don't have my tail drag license yet or whatever. But I was like, Well. I can help fund that too. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, I have an elderly couple that lives across from um, me and my family's house and retired and, you know, they don't do much but walk the dog every day. And um, I give them stuff all the time, salmon, and we have a bunch of gardens and yeah. berries in our backyard. And I, I tell, I tell the lady anytime, just come back and grab whatever you want. And she comes with, you know, I got two little boys at home and she comes with, plates and plates of cookies and banana breads and raspberry stuff that she's using from our stuff to do it and you know i give them fresh salmon before i freeze it and it just feels so good just to do that you know for them well they also when you when you give something like that if you if you went over to your neighbor and you were like hey i got this prime ribeyes from mr prime beef they're 40 bucks a pound and you gave him three of them He's going to be like, thanks, and he'll eat them, I'm sure, but he's not going to treat it like when you give someone game, they're like, they're not going to let it go to waste. It's not going to freeze or burn. Mm -hmm. They're going to use it because they understand like it's different. It's just different. There's a lot more, there's just more to it and it's special and it's a, it's a, one of the best presents. Like that's all I give to people. Yeah. Like Christmas, we just send like cooler little six pack coolers down to people filled with burger couple steaks you need never, my address never sheep <laughs> <laughs> no one gets no. sheep <laughs> well i think uh, i think most folks recognize or appreciate and or respect the effort and sacrifices that go into doing it yeah. and, and i say that when leaving your home to your families um mostly doing rel- relatively dangerous or somewhat some risk involved when it's going out in the wild right whether it's flying boating hiking crossing creeks whatever it is you're doing there is some form of risk so there's that part of it and and then just the sheer 
work and sometimes pure misery. Yeah, they hear the stories <laughs> that you go through to do it, and um, yeah, I think that's a helps t- make it taste a little bit better too. Yeah, but welcome to Alaska Wild Project episode eighty four. Today in the house we have Mr. John Sturgeon. He is the president of Safari Club International Alaska and also the director of the Wild Sheep Foundation, Alaska Wild Fe- Sheep Foundation. Thanks for coming in. Uh, my pleasure. That's how we start our show, John. <laughs> we, had to, we had to get the, the caribou call going real oh, quick. Okay. There. okay. You ever heard a caribou call before? Oh, uh, not really. Yeah, <laughs> that was they it. work though. Kind of, for the record, <laughs> they kind of grunt. <laughs> <laughs> well, before they grunt, they come to that. So uh, okay, I have to try that sometime. <laughs> you should. You'd be surprised. Okay. In the area, you may not see many caribou all of a sudden. Okay. <laughs> I got a weird question um, for all of you. How many freezers do you have? Three. 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 One. One. There's just two of us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got three. Yeah. I got one that's like fish and Costco stuff and then the game freezer. I got two stand ups and a little smaller one. Yeah. Like I need a chest. chest. I have a small I, chest. I need to get rid of the other small little stand up that I got. I'm into the stand ups because yeah. it's. You don't, you don't leave all that stuff on the. No, oh, that's man. the best. I need a, I need a chest for hides. Okay, oh. just like you know, you get a black bear, yeah. and you, you, you flush him up and salt it, and you're gonna get it tanned later. Like you it's love, nice to have that. You love that dabble. I take yeah. that right down the road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drop it off. <laughs> you like to boil it's actually it. Actually, not that. Much I, I, fun, I, I, I think it's awesome that you do it. Yeah, it's hard to find time anymore yeah. these days. John, let's start with uh, some of your Alaska history here. Run us through, uh, you know, maybe if you weren't born here, what brought you here, and uh, some of the things that you've been getting into since back in the day. Well, I think probably like a lot of you guys, I uh, uh, grew up in Minnesota, and uh, uh, from as long as I can remember, I was going to come to Alaska mm-hmm. and uh, went in the service uh, after high school. Um, Two tours in Vietnam, uh, went to college after that, had a degree in forestry, got my first job in Ringle, Alaska as a forester, and uh, worked there for about four years, and then moved to Anchorage, um, worked for the state of Alaska for a while, uh, and, and uh, ended my career with the state as the, the state forester, the director of division of forestry, and then took a job as a um, the president of a company called Concord Forest Products, the timber company we mainly logged on uh, uh, on private land, never had any government timber, so it was, was kind of nice. And um, I ran several of my own businesses, import-export businesses with China because we had a lot of business with uh, selling logs overseas, so I got some contacts over there, and and um, that's kind of my career. I'm, I'm attempting to be uh, retired now. I'm pretty <laughs> proud. I've, re- I've retired five times now. I think I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, still on retainer for... Uh, Zinke Native Corporation to kind of end up their, their logging operation on a fog mark. And it's about uh, another four-year contract, and then, I'll, then I'll, be, I'll be done. You'll actually retire, retire. You bet. Okay. <laughs> That's a good answer. That'll be your sixth Probably. retirement party? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many well, watches do you got? <laughs> well, actually, I got a few. <laughs> How, how is the uh, logging what industry? How, how's how's it uh, how's it doing? Pretty pathetic. Um, there mm-hmm. is no problem in Alaska with uh, resources. Uh, Alaska has uh, an abundance of uh, timber all across the state. Uh, the red basket of Alaska's timber is in southeast Alaska on the Tongass, and um, there's uh, uh, maybe one sawmill still operating in southeast Alaska. Uh, and they're probably doing about maybe 5% of what they did uh, um, maybe 20 years ago. So it's pretty much pretty much dead. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, in the industry during the heyday, um, but that's kind of long gone. Where has that business uh, moved to? Well, it's just uh, the supply of timber dried up. It's mainly from the Tongass National Forest, and it's, uh, um, they just don't sell any timber anymore. But there's people still need it, though. It's got to come from somewhere. Is it Canada, Canada now? It comes from Canada. Canada's okay. a big supplier. Okay. British Columbia, British, mainly? Yeah, mainly British Columbia. And okay. uh, even down south in Oregon, Washington, they don't log as much as they used to. The forest, 
U.S. Forest Service used to be, you know, considered a multiple-use agency, and they don't walk much anymore. Mm. Uh, they're more uh, in the recreation and mm. and that kind of thing. So it's uh, uh, the, the wood comes from, you know, um, southeast uh, Alabama. They grow trees down there in about, uh, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, Alaska takes about 90 years to get the kind of same size tree because our growing season is so short, but mm-hmm. um, that's Alaska. Not much of an industry left anymore. Yeah. Wow. Do you, do you uh, foresee a bounce back, or do you think that that's just going to eventually die out? I think it's on its last legs. I hate to say that because that's mm. been my uh, my occupation for the last, uh, you know, 50 years. Yeah. But uh, you got to have trees to cut, and the, the trees are, at least on federal land, are pretty tied up. And at least on the near-term horizon, there doesn't look like there's much uh, of a chance of them selling any additional timber. Yeah. I wonder if universities are still even offering those types of uh, degrees or education and oh, that yeah. type of thing. Oh, yeah. Forestry is a um, still a pretty popular degree. I mean, you still have uh, companies like Weyerhaeuser and Boise Cascade and, you know, states uh, still uh, sell uh, timber. And even, you know, a state like New York, believe it or not, they sell a lot of timber. They log mm. a lot of timber. It's yeah. hardwoods. Upstate. Yeah. So there's still some good jobs for foresters. Okay. Is there a, um, a certain country or area in the world that has kind of taken advantage? I've heard Brazil um, is doing a lot of logging. Is there one that stands out? Well, um, uh, there's some that are kind of really unusual. One would be Chile and New Zealand. They uh, brought a tree from California called radiata pine. And in uh, California, it grows up in high high alpine country, barely grows, grows very, very slow. They took that uh, tree to uh, Chile, uh, New Zealand, and they planted it, and um, they get about a 24-inch tree in about 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, just unbelievable, sometimes even less than that. And they plant them in rows just like crops, and um, that's supplying a lot of the countries like Japan and, and China and Korea for their wood. It's, uh, they grow it like a crop. It just grows really, really fast. The United States, it doesn't grow very good, but yeah. in those climates, no soils, yep. it's incredible. That's crazy. Oh, that is amazing. So is the, like, Tongass National, or the, the Tongass. Um, Tongass National Forest. Yeah, the, it's, it's a um, tropical, it's um Rainforest? Rainforest. rainforest thank yeah. you, thank you. That's what I was shooting for. Um, is the tr- are the trees population, is it still healthy? Is it still good, or, or did did we over log? Or I mean, I, I I don't know if that's a sensitive question to a log guy in a logging career, but did we manage our harvest enough in the days to now where where? Well, the way the Forest Service was was mandated by law to manage their their um, their, their lands, they have uh, what they call they have to harvest on a sustained yield basis. So they have a a, a, a foundation of timber. And if it takes 90 years to grow a tree, they can only cut one ninetieth of it each year. And that's mm. called their annual allowable cut. Mm. And I think at the, at the very heyday of the Tongass National Forest, I think there was 10% of the timbered lands that were set aside uh, for that timber harvest. So there never was a lot of it uh, set aside. And it's just uh, a small chunk. Yeah, it's spread out. But sometimes they're in pretty sensitive areas. Some of the best trees mm-hmm. grow in uh, you know watersheds where there are salmon and people use them and stuff. So um, certainly the world has changed where you can log and where you can't log. And where it was acceptable in one place, it's kind of not that same way today. But right. uh, we still need wood, like you said. I mean, you've got to have raw materials from somewhere. You do. We're still building. Yep. So it's an environmental. It's an environmentalist type thing that shut it shut down the oh absolutely yeah. absolutely and the forest service uh, um they've even tried to put up timber sales and you know federal laws are so complex and you got to do it an environmental or um um a uh, uh you know, all these studies before uh, you can put up a timber sale on an eis um environmental impact statement and sometimes they're you know, when they're all done, they're about eight, nine inches thick. Yeah. Oh, a lot wow. of times cost, you know, three, four million dollars to put them together. And the timber isn't worth that much a lot of times. But mm-hmm. that's the regulations. And the more complex it is, the more hooks for folks to stop development. And so it's it just, I don't see it happening unless, the, you know, something changes in our, our, our culture and our economy where we really, really, really need wood. Um, then it might change again. But we're, we're not there now, and I don't see it in the near future. 
So in your eyes, it's kind of federal overreach. Yep. Yep. I, I, uh, uh, yes and no. I think it's uh, th- that that's maybe a little bit different case. It's more, uh, um, a lot of people don't want to see logging on the Tongas and with all the rules, regulations that they have, as far as uh, putting up a timber sale or doing any kind of development, it's uh, very, very, very difficult to, to, you know, get something through uh, to, to the, to the final, final sale. I mean, you put up a five-year plan, um, that's challenge in court. You, you, mm. you put up an uh, environmental analysis, you know, a couple of years before you plan on doing an environmental impact statement, you get sued. You do an environmental impact statement, you get sued. It's uh, inadequate and incomplete, and so it's just really tough. I mean, I don't kind of don't even blame the Forest Service. It's just like they got an impossible task to do. Yeah. But, uh, but this, you know, there's still timber being harvested. I'm also on a mental health trust board. And um, I'm head of the resources committee, and we still sell timber. In fact, we just sold a sale for 60 million board feet down in Ketchikan. Mm. And uh, um, we have other timber sales in Icy Bay and other places. So there's still some timber being sold, but just not on federal land. Gotcha. I bet you saw, you've saw you seen a lot of changes. Um, what year did you say you started? 1970. Man, I mean, the equipment alone and the safety protocols – is there a crazy injury story or something that happened that you want to could well, share? I, I think, unfortunately, I've had a lot of them where people have logging is a very dangerous business, especially timber falling. And oh, I uh, bet. There, there's just lots of uh, examples I can give, which I'd rather not. I'd rather not remember them because okay. I'm my friends. No, that's yeah. understood. And, yeah, yeah. No, that just comes with the business, and it's risky and has its good days and its bad days, right? Yep. I don't yeah. think sometimes people don't realize. You know, people that. Uh, uh, you know, the wood table you have here, what it takes to, you know, to get that wood, what it takes to get paper, what it takes to get metal. It's, uh, I think a lot of people uh, um, do some pretty risky things. Yeah. Yeah, and you see, like, the shows. Do you, yeah. ever, do you ever follow any of that, John? Like, the, the silly logging. Couple, I mean, uh, some of them are like, come on. They are, come on. You know? we, we, we had uh, <laughs> two or three of them call us up and wanted to go at our logging operation on a fog neck and, do a show and i said no i don't think not, so not jumping on that bandwagon no no man. no, no. Uh, it's a lot of acting in it and it's it's uh, yeah you don't see people fighting on the on the <laughs> landings you don't see people uh diving out of the way of logs and i mean there's a little more safety to that than than they show on those shows they got to make it exciting i guess but yeah that's the way it is you know one of the more uh really cool uh log harvesting processes is the underwater stuff I always thought that yeah. was pretty interesting. I know they made some silly shows about it, but it clearly is there's an industry for it, right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen any of that or have been involved or maybe you have some colleagues or friends that that do it? Is I, I've heard of, heard about it. It's like the, the lost silver mine in Nevada. Yeah. You know, if you can just find a lake where they, they sunk all these uh, old growth uh, red cedar. And <laughs> yeah, yeah right. So, so I, there's a few of them. There was a guy that came to me. He was in Panama. Oh, and wow. There was a big lake there that was supposed to be a timber worth millions of dollars. <laughs> I'm not sure what ever happened, but it's, uh, like I said, it's like uh, the El Dorado mine in in, uh, in Nevada that nobody ever found. <laughs> right. So they wanted you to come out and, and work it? or No, or they wanted us to bankroll it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Seems a little risky. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, a little treasure hunt. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. is there really something yeah. in there? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> oh. So what was some of the transitions you've seen maybe when, uh, like, native corporations came in and and, and w- all that with uh, ANLICA and all that? Was it just a da- drastic change in the way operations happened? Um, it certainly was a boom to the timber industry. Okay. Because mm. we had all the native corporations in the southeast Alaska. They got, I think, on the average, about 22,000 acres each. Mm. And uh, it was around their, their core... Um, uh, villages and a lot of them made a lot of money mm. and uh, um, some invested it wisely some didn't yeah so but a lot of it gave a lot of native corporations that own timber kind of a big jump start yeah that's great so that's it had good. an overall positive impact for sure i mean yeah i think so i think yeah. that uh, the impact was that it uh, kind of bankrolled them to move into other things there we go yeah, help them yeah. jumpstart into other yeah. projects and, and support. As you know, Native Corporations of Alaska are doing pretty good there. <laughs> yeah. Look yeah. at the uh, Alaska Business Monthly comes up with a top 49. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of Native Corporations. They're almost, in fact, 
the majority of our, our I'd say the majority for yeah, sure our native corporations and that's um, pretty yep. impressive you yeah, can it consider is. that uh, you know compare that to the, the reservation system down south i think what they did in alaska here was a great experiment and i think they you know, it was a successful one i think native corporations are doing well a lot of shareholders are getting jobs or um most of the corporations, if you're a kid and a young person, you want to go to college or trade school or whatever, and you know, normally you can. So it's uh, worked yeah, out pretty well. Yeah, lots of great programs yep. and opportunities for, for youth and people that are wanting to find a career or something. That right. They have right. all that opportunity right. for them. It's pretty sweet. Right. Do you remember your first hunt in Alaska? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a deer hunt in southeast Alaska. I still remember my first moose hunt. Uh, we lived in Wrangell, picked a place on a map on the Yukon River, and took our boats there and set up camp and woke up in the morning, and there was a moose standing on the bank. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is, this great. is easy. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I've hunted. I didn't go this year. It's the first time I missed it in 52 years. Same oh, place. wow. Yeah. You've been going to the same camp. 52 years. 52 seasons that's yep. legendary yeah. that's so oh, that's so we, awesome. we were just we uh, was it just, was it this episode or, or a few back or no i, I don't think the last one i don't think we even said it on the on air i think we were just talking about it off the off the mic um about the difference in yeah like the pros and cons of having that like dedicated spot and and all the all the time and the memories and the stories and the stuff that happens versus if you don't have that, you can do different things. You're not so like committed to that group of dudes, men and women or whatever, and that like having to go to that same spot and you kind of like stuck to it in a sense. Yeah, but it's there's pluses and minuses. <clears throat> right, and you, right. You find out kind of where the hot spots are. Yeah. Uh, you go with the, the same guys and, um, you know, you it's a pretty tough river we run. Uh, mm -hmm. So you kind of know where all the rocks are. They got names. <laughs> and... Uh, um, <laughs> It's uh, it has pluses and minuses to it. Yeah. So, and you know, nowadays we've been going there for so long, and I'm 77 now. So, if we get a moose, we look at each other and said, "Shit, we just wrecked our hunt. <laughs> what did we get ourselves what into? Now? <laughs> now we got now we got to take care of this moose. We just had fun drinking beer and sitting on the riverbank telling yeah. lies to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Now it's all truth from here well, on. That's out. it. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't remember these things being this big. Yeah, <sighs> man, they don't get any lighter either, do they? No, no they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, fifty, fifty-two. I didn't go this year, but it's the first year in a long time. Man. But it was that. Um, did that was like heartbreaking, or was it like just? I know you mentioned before we went on air, you had some really cool hunting experiences with the wounded warriors and 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 what you did. Did is that why? Yeah, you, we, you we took. Go? I, had, I have a friend that's a wounded warrior, triple amputee. Yeah, both legs gone at the hip. And uh, I've taken them elk hunting in Montana, and I think I mentioned you got an elk with a bow and arrow. You, yeah, you said yep. that. And yep. then, so I, I've taken them caribou hunting, taken them uh, deer hunting on a fog neck. In fact, that was about four years ago. We had a governor was our packer. We took <laughs> three wounded warriors, and uh, they got three deer. And so this year, he put in for the DM-795, which is out of uh, Fort Greeley. Mm. And uh, he drew it with the five other wounded warriors. And so I decided to go up there and hunt with him instead. And we... Took us two and a half days to get him a moose, but we got him one. So wasn't the only, only two and a half? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a uh, you know Fort Greeley and any any bull. It's a uh, it's, yeah. It's pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool area. Yeah. Yeah, I had the privilege of hunting back in that area. I don't know. We got some access. Had to cross a creek, but we had uh, cow tags back in there. And that's the first time I've ever seen a herd of moose. Yeah. I saw, like, I think I counted 63 moose in one spot. And there was, like, 30 or 40 bulls in there. And they were, I mean, it was a herd. Yeah. It was, like, a herd of caribou, but it was all moose. It was, yeah. I looked down there, and I'm like, that was all those brown spots. The moose Get the spotting the scope on there. I'm like, oh, my God. This is October, of course. Peak rut. Yeah. You know, I don't think they're always that grouped up, but I was blown away at the moose population. Well, they had a pretty area. tough winter. They so did a bison up there. They oh, lost a big. Did they get whacked? Real bad. But yeah, uh, the nicest part about the hunt was uh, we had the base commander Ford really come out to have dinner with us the first night. The locals set up a local veteran set up a camp up there with tents. Oh, and then, way cool! Yeah, and, and they uh, take care of the wounded warriors. And the base commander says, "Well, when you get one down, give me a call. We'll have our young." Uh, 
Uh, young, young, yeah. Yeah. Well, you ruck, you ruck, crew. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> young, young privates will be there. And, uh, so Perfect. Nice. That's okay. PT, right. PT is going to be a little different this morning, <laughs> boys. <laughs> Bring your packs empty. Yeah, we got one right near the road, so we didn't have to call them. So it was okay. That was good. But all the wounded warriors, they had to be uh, to apply for that permit. You have to be a Purple Heart recipient, and you have to be 100% service connected disabled. Mm. And so it's a pretty limited group of people that can apply for it, and it's a, a yeah. great hunt. And the folks and the veterans up at Delta do a great. Now the community does a great. You know the people that have the the um, um, uh, rent cans uh, donate the rent cans. People mm-hmm. come cool. with meals. Uh, um, all the locals are just extremely supportive in Delta. So it's a, a great, great program. I think it's the thirteenth year they've had it up there. That's awesome. Good good program. So that's a that's, that's a good trade for you then. If you're if you're gonna miss your moose camp, that's yeah. that's not yeah, a bad a memorable reason trip there. why. Yeah. Well uh, also Safari Club um uh they bankroll the project. They pay for all six uh, wounded warriors airfare. They pay for their license, they pay for their mm-hmm. tags, um they pay for the meat processing and they pay to have the meat shipped home. And I think four of the six uh, we're from the lower 48. Mm. So it's not an inexpensive thing. It costs Safari Club about 25000 a year for that program, but well worth it. Like I felt kind of guilty that I got to see the smile on their faces and yeah. you know, the delight of uh, those guys, especially my friend Mike Nicholson, the triple amputee guy. Uh, he, got, he stepped on a 40-pound landmine when he was, uh, oh, was 22 years old. He's 32 oh, now man. and uh, blew him, I think he said, 18 feet in the air. Wow. And... Uh, um, so anyway, for him to be able to go, yeah. it's uh, pretty pretty rewarding. He so. is probably the most grateful and gracious hunter ever. Oh, he was just a great guy. Oh, I, man. I've, I've taken him on I can only imagine. five hunts now. Way cool. Yeah, and he's a great, great guy. And Sounds like he's just absolutely had an amazing experience too with his with his harvest record well he's he's uh five for five which is yeah. pretty good so hell yeah and uh he's a he's a like i said legs are going at the hip so we had no wow. prosthetics and there's something called the invictus games it's a, a game you've yep. heard of yeah the, the, this year was in netherlands it's the uh, for militaries that have handicaps from all over the world and uh he went last spring and he took seven gold medals and one silver medal so he's quite an athlete besides that guy's an absolute savage <laughs> yeah i mean that's in that's insane i just i just watched a thing about a week ago that uh black rifle coffee company did and they um man i'm forgetting his name now but he's a guide out of kodiak and uh i know him from sornex's uh winter uh deal and uh he took a he took a wounded warrior for uh, a Black Rifle Coffee Company. I think bankrolled it, but he um, he's in the same boat as your buddy. He's a W amputee at the hip. Um, I think he has both of his arms though, and he took him on a goat hunt in Kodiak. Wow! <laughs> wow. Holy smokes! And, wow. and the guide carried him. They built a special Eberly stock, I believe. Built a special backpack. And he he used it at um ah oh man what's the bow what's the bow thing that happens at ski resorts total archery challenge mm. so they pract they they practiced and did some training stuff at the total archery challenge and he carried him around the total archery challenge in a backpack wow and uh, he, he took That's him on a go hunt and got him a go I think I saw that oh, like video they or something made a video that? it's, yeah, it's okay, like I, I mean you'll be you'll be crying um, yeah. Guaranteed. Check that out. Well, looking it up at the Invictus Games Foundation, look at this thing. I mean, this is like oh, a worldwide it's, it's Olympic. It's insane. So it's other countries. It's not just an American thing. This is no, like the Olympics. Yeah. It's yeah. international. Yeah. 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 Wow, that is huge. Yeah. I think it actually went on right after the Olympics, didn't it? I don't remember. It was in the Netherlands, so I'm not sure. They usually do because they'll use those same venues mm. um, for the for the next event and also like the Special Olympics and things like that. Yeah. Do you know what uh, events he participated in? Some of them. He, uh, wheelchair racing, there's different distances. And okay. He's, yeah. he's a swimmer. And, oh, nice. uh, wow. Uh, rowing. They have like a indoor uh, rowing and I think biking. Okay. Um, uh, where he uses hands. Hand yeah. 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 But I, I don't know the, the events, but I know wheelchair racing, he goes out every day and does five miles and pretty um, 
pretty pretty neat guy. Man, wow, just totally wired. Yeah, a different way. So so what all does he what Resilient. all did he get already? He's got his moose. He's got his elk, caribou, caribou, um, deer, deer, black-tailed deer, and he got a fox, and a fox, so, silver Sweet. fox. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, he yeah. so guys got two elk. Okay, in Montana. So what's on his list though? Uh, trying to work on a brown bear hunt. Okay. Um, the way I understand right it, uh, uh, you know, I run a logging operation in the Fognac, so we have about five, six hundred miles of road, and we got vehicles and stuff over there. It's all private land. Mm. And uh, the way I understand it is that if you're uh, wheelchair bound, you can actually bait bear anywhere if you get a permit from Fish and Game. Oh. So the next is uh, we're going to try to see if we can get him a, a Kodiak brown bear. Wow. Yeah. Do you see good populations in your area? The browns. The, the, the brown bears? Oh, lots of brown bears on the yeah. back. Yeah. yeah, lots and lots of them. Yep. Oh. Yeah, that... Um, Too many, the, if you ask me. <laughs> there are, there are. You get, a, you get an elk down... You're hiking down, in the dark. <laughs> way yeah. too many. Yeah, you get an elk down, and you got a, you know, probably within two hours, you got about a 50% chance yeah. of bear being on you, and by next morning, it's about 95%. Yeah, I, pay, wow. I, I paid a... I paid a a hind quarter tax on the elk there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and those elk are not easy to get. So and it was high up in a tree, high, as high as I could put it, in the tallest tree I could find. Yeah. Well, I had assembled two bear fences, one for the downed elk and one for camp. Yeah, that was the plan. I was thinking, that's what I was told to do. Yeah, it didn't even dawn on me, and I'm like, two bear fences? Uh, yeah, yeah. You put an elk down. You put the fence around. The, um, oh. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. I guess you leave it there, you might come back to nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a quick second. We'll be right yeah, back. Let's do it. Barney Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand-selected gear since 1963. Barney specializes in supplying hunters with the absolute best Alaskan proven gear on the market for some of nature's most rugged and demanding terrain. Whether you're headed to the remote volcanic islands of the Alaska Peninsula in search of a brown bear or the shale-infested glacial valleys of the Brooks Range for doll sheep. It is critical you choose the right gear for your dream hunt. Don't miss Barney's exclusive brand, Frontier Gear of Alaska, tested from the high mountains of Tajikistan to the extreme conditions of Alaska. These products were designed for high performance and durability. Frontier Gear was derived from decades of experience hunting big game in Alaska. Paired with other top brands, it provides you the absolute best gear selection anywhere in the world. Stop in at Barney Sports Chalet in Anchorage on Northern Lights or check out their custom website and reference tool at barneysports.com. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. At Total Truck, you can find brands such as ARE, RSI Smart Caps, Goose Gear, Eye Camper, Front Runner, Rigid Lights, Rhino Linings Bed Liners, and everything you need to outfit your truck or SUV. Alaska Overlander provides 4x4 vehicles and expedition trailers, custom modified for Alaskan adventures, and outfitted with rooftop tents, fridges, and all the camping and cooking gear you need to start exploring. Visit them at alaskaoverlander.com. So, so John, we, you had mentioned the... Uh uh, the moose hunt, and I had asked you off air. We talked about you can throw them on, John. Yeah, uh, I said, Hey, have you gotten out moose hunting? Because you're a bit, I figure you're a busy guy, so I thought you were going to give us like one or two. But I, I have to ask so you we can get this on air if you can give us a little rundown of your of your uh itinerary, if you will, uh, maybe what you've done and what you got going on because it was pretty impressive. It's well, fun to hear that. Remember, I'm retired now, so I got a little more okay. time to know. Well, people. allegedly, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. Well, what'd you say? You have seven sat. What was the what was the quote? Well, I got the, six Saturdays and was yeah, one Sunday or something. Six Saturdays and one Sunday every week. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you're retired. That's what you guys will have eventually. So. <laughs> now like start that. start off September first with the wounded warrior hunt up yep. at uh, 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 Fort Greeley. Fort Greeley, yeah. Six uh, wounded warriors, uh, all Purple Heart recipients, all 100 percent disabled. Um, uh, service connected disabled and uh, we went six for six it was a great great hunt the folks in Delta were just wonderful and yep. Safari Club uh, the bank rolls out they pay for the uh, airfare and the tags and the meat processing yeah. and shipping and yep, yep. all that and then um, it went um, uh, on the uh, Tetlin Indian Reservation of a 
uh, a friend that has the concession on that, and we got a 60-inch oh, bull with five five brow tines on each side. It was a, a great, great hunt. Oh, and beautiful then, uh, critter. Yeah, that's no. uh, the Wrangles. Yeah, out by the or the Nowitzen. Uh, and it's a um, by Tetlin. Yeah, right, right. By Toke. We could actually see yeah. the lights in between Toke. Toke and Nabezna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. So then um, uh, we um, went on that hunt, and then uh, uh, we got a. Um, uh, I'm gonna take my granddaughter on a antelope hunt in Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, I went on an archery elk hunt in Wyoming, uh, not Wyoming, but Montana. There's a friends with a big ranch there, and. Uh, elk won that one. We didn't uh, <laughs> didn't get an elk, but uh, saw lots of them. Just couldn't couldn't connect on it. And then um, going to head to um, uh, my son has an elk hunt in uh, Montana. We're at uh, Wyoming. We're going to go on on Evanston, Wyoming, and then um, I'll probably get over to Fognac uh, for some deer hunting. Maybe elk over there during the registration period, but not sure about that one yet. So that's one of the benefits of being retired is you can, you can do a lot more hunting than you did when you're working. Ain't that the truth? Uh, yeah. Live, living day. the dream, John. Living yeah, the dream, I, man. I guess. I guess. Yeah. I wish yeah. I had those plans going on. I'm like, uh, work, work, basketball, hockey practice. <laughs> <laughs> Some more work. <laughs> you know, you had to cancel a hunt. <laughs> I'm like, man, what the hell? What am I doing with my life here? Well, for people that don't uh, really know what um, SCI is and what you guys stand for, give us a little rundown on on specifically what SEI in Alaska is doing and what they stand for? Well, um, uh, SEI, Safari Club International, Alaska chapter, uh, we have about 600, 650 members kind of consistently. We have a banquet every year. And uh, we do several things. One, uh, we mentioned earlier, we sponsor Wounded Warrior programs. We sponsor a lot of, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is get more youth and more ladies involved in hunting. And so we sponsor programs that uh, uh, encourage that. Um, we do stuff with, like uh, earlier said, veterans. Um, our motto is uh, uh, Safari Club First for Hunters, and we try to defend uh, the hunter's right to hunt in Alaska, uh, which is being seriously threatened. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about the Federal Subsistence Board, what's going on with that. They yep. set aside 7.5 million acres in uh, Unit 23 and 26, just north of Kotzebue. Um, we're involved in that. We testify. We write uh, testimony. Um, we um, uh, whatever we can do to support hunting. That's that's kind of our our, our mission. Um, we have a oh, about a I think like a twelve person board. Um, all people pretty avid hunters, and I just happen to be the president last year and this year, and my term ends in July. Uh, and I also work on on, on government. Uh, uh, issues. Um, there's a lot of things that affect hunting, and a lot of legislation that can affect it. So we try to work on that stuff. And but bottom line is we're here to uh, we're all hunters ourselves, and we're here to protect hunting rights as best we can. And the biggest thing right now is the the Federal Subsistence Board, which is kind of gone rogue from what they've done in the past. And so it's a a, a big deal. And one of the big uh, I think accomplishments we had in that front is that um, we've been uh, talking to our national office uh, based out of uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, to hire an attorney to work on Alaskan issues full time. Mm. And mm. Uh, a person, they just hired a person, a lady, her name is Maddie, and Avid Hunter herself, she's actually uh, gotten um, our golly uh, sheep. And so anybody wow. that's gotten our golly, you know they're pretty serious. Oh, yeah, they're serious. And so she's the new attorney that's going to focus on exclusively on Alaskan issues. That's great. Um, she's not going to be here in Alaska, but you know, nowadays you don't really have to be. So, mm. um, And we've got a lot of challenges with. Uh, you know, access issues, uh, RS4277s. We've got uh, uh, areas being closed to hunting. We have the federal government uh, pretty much trying to take over management uh, from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game of, of game. And uh, so there's a lot of big battles out there, and uh, our task is to try to, like I said, protect hunters' rights. Are you guys involved with the Brooks Range deal too, trying to fight what happened there with them closing that sheep area? That we, is, we, that is tw- that, that's what you That's 24? About. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we testified against that. We put in a written testimony, but it's a stacked deck when it comes to the Federal Subsistence Board because they have, you know, three people that are from citizens, but they're from rural areas, um, mm. and uh, the rest of them are head of the, the, the federal agencies, the National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're all the state directors, 
And so it's a stacked deck. There's nobody in there representing kind of the average hunter. Mm. Um, so it's political. And uh, um, what the local, the local um, what they call them, racks, uh, recommend to the Federal Subsistence Board, they take it word for word. And some of the reasons that they have given for closing areas are pretty sketchy. Um, they're like unit um, uh, 23 and 26, the caribou and moose. Uh, the argument was, was simple as saying that uh, people from uh, outside the area are coming in there with airplanes and they're flying over caribou herds and changing the trajectory of the herds. And the other thing they said is that uh, the other thing they said is that uh, local uh, hunters are a lot smarter than the, the folks in the city. And the city folks go out there and a whole herd of caribou comes by and they shoot the very first caribou that comes by. And it changed, the, again, the trajectory of the herd, and they don't go by the villages. And I think anybody that's ever hunted caribou, you don't see big bulls in the front of uh, the herds of caribou. They're usually always the behind. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Push so, them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so that, <laughs> it's just, but it passed unanimously. And uh, they had, I think, Safari Club uh, put out a, um, uh, a, a petition, and we had 6,500 signatures on it against it. Yep. And didn't do any good at all. Just like they balked on it. But they didn't I even, signed it. They didn't. I I tried to listen in. I couldn't even get through on the phone to listen to that. And then all of a sudden, I heard it was over. It was what a seven to one vote. Yep. And they didn't listen to any testimony. Public. Yeah, they testimony. already made up their mind before they it even game. started. Yeah, it was. Well, they had, and it's uh, you can't talk to them direct. You you got to talk through. You, well, you call in. It's a you're talking to staff, and they they summarized your, their comments. And so it's, it's kind of a stacked deck. And so one of the things we're trying to do is uh, see if we can get it more representative, the people that actually use the hunting, want them to base it on science. Uh, the other thing is that uh, when they have a harvest, they don't have to fill out harvest tags. So you don't know how many they're actually harvesting for subsistence. Mm. Um, the, mm. the Federal Subsistence Board is a stacked deck. They don't make decisions based on science. It's more on the recommendations of the local folks. Um, and it's, uh, those resources belong to all of us. How, uh, so, a, so as just the average hunter, like what is the best course of action that you see for the average hunter? Like obviously get involved in, you SCI know, and, SCI and, yeah, and be a member. And, yeah. yeah there, there's a lot that of organizations helps. you can be a part of, but, but like we, I, I, and like, I always say like, it's, it's, it's such a bummer that the hunt, like a lot of the hunting community on social media and stuff is like at odds with each other and it's like we have to be a unified front absolutely because we're a shrinking and so what so what can the average person do who's not on a board or not like i mean help other than you know helping with fundraising and and going to events like just be aware well, I, I think the, the biggest thing is I've had some friends that hunted up in Unit 23 for a lot of years north of, of Kotzebue. And uh, what you don't want to do is just say, oh, well, they went to another area. Or they've mm. hunted there for years. Mm. So what you want to do is get upset. And what you want to do is get involved, like you said, with the organizations. Yeah, fight for it. you got to fight. you got to stand up. you got to go to the organizations that, that are fighting for helping you. You have to donate money. You have to contact your congressional delegation and let them know what you think. Uh, when the Federal Subsistence Board meets, you need to testify and testify from your heart uh, what you think. Um, you just have to get involved and, and just not sit on the couch and let somebody else do it. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, we'll just, just sue them. That's, that, that, <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's the drag not, out, right? That, like, that takes a long, know. long time. It's expensive, and it doesn't, doesn't always work so well. So, yeah. But getting involved in, um, politically and in organizations that support the things that you believe in, um, that's what you have to. And, and, and shows like this, you guys are doing a great service, letting people know what's going on. That's yeah. a big deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's. I just I, I get so frustrated with it because I, you know, like I'm part of Savari Club. I, I signed the like form letter, you know, and, and you send that to your congressman and. It's like all that's like instantaneous and really easy for me. But then beyond that, I'm like, what else can I do? You know, like how, how can we be involved in like, you know, getting youth into it? Cause, cause I want to help people get into it. Cause I know how intimidating it can be. Like I've been outdoors person my whole life. So it, it wasn't, it was just tr- to go 
transition to being a hunter from a snowboarder and a snow machiner is like it's a pretty easy transition but if you don't do those things and get outside and 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 really get into the wild like hunting's a intimidating thing to go do and 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 i i think like you know i i talked to these guys that are uh they they're in the south but and they're trying to they're, they're developing a, it's called the hunter recruitment project and they're trying to expand it nationwide and and i asked them like directly when they were having a, a talk I, I was like okay i get the recruitment but like how do we now how do we hold people because if you take someone hunting that's easy and you can do that and you can make that happen but how do we get how do we retain that person to go do it on their own because a lot of the people i've taken they don't really go do it on their own and and i would love to be involved in these programs that are getting kids involved and youth and and women involved yeah whatever new hunters period like i would love to be part of that and i would donate my time and take people i would give up my hunt to go watch someone else get something I think there are a lot of things you can do. Uh, I know that's one of the focuses of our safari club. Um, and this legislation, for example, is they got a deal now where, as you know, if you're, uh, you can take a kid that's from, I think, 10 years old to 16, they go uh, August 1st to the 5th, they can go sheep hunting. And that's actually working pretty well. Yeah. And then um, uh, you've got, um, uh, you know, like uh, becoming an Alaskan, uh, becoming an Alaskan outdoor woman up in the valley. Um, sold out every single time uh, and programs like that that we're encouraging those are the kind of things that uh, um, that you can do and, and plus take a kid hunting um, you know, yeah I'm taking my granddaughter my granddaughter's got a she's she was 13 years old she got a doll sheep when she was uh, um, uh, 14 she got a uh, um, an elk in Montana and she's going to get a hopefully get a, a big antelope in uh, Wyoming so take kids hunting yeah, um, bring them with you and yeah, next generation. Yeah, right? I think you, know, you plant the seed, and I think mm-hmm. the rest of it takes over. So, yeah. if people were to just reach out and join, like they could, they could volunteer. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you guys, you guys take that on quite a bit. Volunteers. Yeah, we do. We, we, okay. we donate money to different programs. If you got a good program, we'll we'll, we'll donate to it. Excellent. That's one of our you're getting ladies, and and it, it, it's pretty serious because as far as every five years, does a survey how many hunting licenses there are in the United States, and the last five year period, the number of hunters. In the United States, went from 18 million to 16 million. We lost mm. 2 million hunters. Mm. And even a scarier statistic is that most of the people are over 55 years old that are on they're buying those hunting licenses. Yeah, they're aging out. So we've got a problem. We've got to get young people involved, mm. and people like us have to, you know, like you said, maybe give up our hunt to, to look at the bigger picture to be able to get young people yeah. involved in hunting and fishing. Well, I, I will say yeah. that that is one of our main um, goals with what yeah, we're doing focus. here. Um, as you know, uh, the youth now are attached to their phones and their computers and their iPads, and this is a way for us to get this message out to them. I got two sons. He's got three daughters. He's got several kids. They go fishing. They go hunting with us all the time, and and we're showing pictures and showing other people, and I've been working with the school district for 23 years. I'm showing the kids all the time things I'm doing. And I think that that is probably at the top of the list as far as continuing um, this this tradition and this passion of what we love. And if we have these future generations that are coming along that have that same passion and that same love, um, it's going to replace those elderly folks or those people that are dropping out. And also breaking down those barriers of, like you were saying, you'll take somebody new and then they won't go and do it on their own. Because maybe there's some trepidation there. There's a little bit of fear. Um, there's obviously a little bit of expense. Um, but as long as we can begin to break down some of those barriers and yeah, some of those walls. And-, and and I think some of it, too, is is to put some of the blame on ourselves is a lot of times hunters um, and even fishermen, we're very private. We're very reserved about where we're going, what we're doing. We don't want to share what we're doing, where we're going. And so then they don't know. They don't have any of the knowledge or any of the um, education on where they could go how on their to, own. How to find it, yeah. So then it's it just it just puts another wall up like, yeah. well, I can't go to where you took me and I'm, I don't really want to just choose a spot on the map. You know, so I, I almost feel like it would be beneficial to be like establish, uh, 
I don't know, like this is areas for newer hunters, things like that, where it's like, this is a good spot for beginners. This is a good beginning hunt. Um, you know, anytime I'm taking somebody new, I like to start them on like a caribou hunt or something like that. It's yeah. a little less. Unit 13 area. Yeah, things like that, where it's like, if you're new, this is something you can access and everyone's willing to share unit 13 areas you know a little, outside a of, little more accessible a little yeah. bit more accessible mm-hmm. a little bit easier to get to um you don't really need to have the biggest baddest you know side by side or or diesel truck and all that you can just go in your yeah. whatever you got and get back in there and 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 find an animal and i think that the fear that people have of being able to get out there on their own is one of those big barriers yeah and, but i think that that wall comes down when they see children and women doing it yeah how, yeah that's Absolutely. the important part right is how do we lower the barrier to entry well give you guys an opportunity uh, we have our our safari club uh, banquet the nina center we have a day of classes mm. and if you guys like to put on like a one hour two hour class uh you know going hunting for the first time or introduction intro to hunting. hunting or something yeah we will advertise it and uh you can maybe help oh, people hell uh, yeah man we would love to do that okay. i've been going to your guys so cool. um things for a long time we'll, we'll put you down for that we'll give you an hour or two hours whatever you need and we'll advertise it and fish and game advertises it and uh you know, i think you can help people uh, find out you know how do you find a spot yeah um and you know people can find a spot looking at maps talking to fish and game people it's mm-hmm. not impossible. There's no, a, there's a process no, to it. it just takes time, commitment, and time more than anything. I think I spoke earlier in the show about the sacrifice, and a lot of that is time. You know, you can't just – can you go weekend warrior hunting? Absolutely. You, you, know? you absolutely can, and some people, but, some people, that has to be their that has to be their entry. Yeah, but, I mean, sometimes it's like, man, I just – you got three days, you got five days. I mean, like, can we get you – out of work for just a few days and yeah like get you in there because sometimes it's that you need that to to truly get the experience that maybe kind of get some hook line and sinker the success is yeah gonna come. the more time you have the higher rate of you know, success for sure plus you can you can spend a lot of time at home on your computer and you know, with google maps nowadays yep. and sure sure you, you have uh um, permits and just the supplement yeah, and, and all that calling stuff. calling fish and game yep. um mm-hmm. you know you can you actually you, you, you know, people you know, you teach them how to use the process, what, what's out there. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, podcasts like you guys yeah. have. There's mm-hmm. there's um, the chat rooms and stuff. There's a lot of things I mean, people can. Those are all things that could be in that introductory class, just like bringing the attention to like, I mean, there's there's so, I mean, how, I don't know, like I probably have three of them on my own phone. Yeah. I got Onyx. Well, Onyx, I, I, Onyx breaks down every game management unit, every, every private land. I, I got base map. I got, uh, I got like three, four well, different can, apps: Garmin, Earthmate. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, even just navigating a D, F, and G's. So, yeah, yeah. You know, well, which which kudos to them yeah. because they've made it pretty streamlined. Yeah. Um, as they transition from from paper copies to now everything's online and PDFs. the way that you can download mm-hmm. those maps and and have your own personal maps. I mean, big big kudos to them for everything they've been doing. Um, but a lot of people don't know that. You you can well, go into the, the Raspberry Fishing Game Office and the, every one of those guys in there is as helpful as can be. Yeah. Yep. It's not it's not a post office or a DMV. It's not those type of workers. Yeah. Those guys are very helpful. They'll give you all the information they, they hunt, can. They do all the same Point you stuff. in a direction. Mm-hmm. They're great great dudes. Great experience every time I've gone in there. Yep. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that we could. I mean that could be a book of cliff notes for our well, we'll class. Oh, that would be, be fun. Tell me an hour or two hours and we'll do the advertising and you guys got... You know, when when time uh, of year is the banquet? I forget. I think it's, it's in It's coming February. up here. Not, oh, February. it's February. February. Okay, because yeah. it's before the, the, wild, the sheep. Sheep, wild Sheep Banquet, right? I think it's right after it. No. Uh, uh, yeah, Wild Sheep is going to be uh, like the first of... Uh, it's like two weeks before the Safari Club. Oh, okay. It's after. It's yeah, middle of March. And it's it, isn't there two banquets for for SCI? I, I, we used to have a military night and then a regular night, and we decide just to go with a regular night for the big banquet, and then we have like more like a reception, and mm. people kind of just talk. The Friday night, we come and have a beer and talk to people. So okay, we cool. didn't do the whole blowing, whole blowing thing. So. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Has SCI looked into any type of these programs that could be um, done in school districts? 
Or is that a touchy like? Like so in long. the curriculum, you mean? Uh, who like, just did that? Color, Wyoming. What? One of the northwest states, like uh, Hunter's Education, just became a like it's a high like school. a high school it's class. A, it's a high school thing. Yeah. We we actually sent teachers, um, both Wild Sheep Foundation and Safari Club, uh, pay for teachers to go to like uh, classes down south. Like they have a like these uh, uh, I want to call them a ranch, but like places where you can go and they they introduce them to kind of like wildlife. a camp almost. Yeah, like a camp. Like wild, mm-hmm. like teachers go like wildlife management. Oh. And explain things to them, and then they go back and you know pass the word. I think we send like three people a year or something like that. Oh, that's amazing. Sign me up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, Mr. Daniel, man, I'll be Sign there. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another. That's another thing that's super important is that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that can be done um, with the imagery of hunting in the like social media space. There's a I, I've told you about it's about the podcast uh, Blood Origins. Yeah, like they're mm-hmm. very they're very very focused on like that and um, and showing that hunting is like is conservation and they're showing all the reasons why and it's a it's a guy um, I'm forgetting his name he's a super nice guy but he um, he's from South Africa and now he lives in uh, Mississippi I think Louisiana maybe but um he's doing a really good job of that podcast of getting people on there who are like I was an anti hunter and now I'm a hunter. I was a vegan and now I hunt and a lot of a lot of like that and his his big thing is that um is that the hunting community has so much division like in the online world and like you know the bow hunter some bow hunter hardcore bow hunters like don't like rifle hunting because they don't think it's and they're like stick bow hunters are like ah oh, you got a compound bow and there's like yeah. there's like all this competition sheep hunters are like ah oh, you hunt moose like anyone can oh you ride a four-wheeler you know there's there's yeah, this yeah. all there's all the oh you fly in we walk in only there's just so yeah. much of this like like nitpicking i'm doing it different and yeah it creates and it, separation and it, and it shouldn't it? like if it's mm. if fishing game decided that you can hunt this way if they said if fishing game decided you can use a rocket launcher then you shouldn't frown on someone who is and you know i i always like there was there was things where it's pretty you know with example, like archery we get what you're yeah, saying with, yeah uh, with, <laughs> with archery with archery hunts in some places because archery hunts in alaska it's not an advantage really but in a lot of states it is it extends your season or it Mm -hmm. puts you into the rut or or there's a lot of advantage to it and and a lot of people disagree about allowing crossbows in there but then when you you hear about someone who is like disabled they can't and they can't pull they can't draw yeah like the crossbow is the only way they're gonna do it and so like we just have to, I think we just, as a hunting, the hunting community in general just like has to stop nitpicking each other and we got to be cohesive because we are shrinking. And as we shrink and we lose numbers, we're not going to have that voting power and, and it, it can get taken away from us chunk by chunk, just like they're doing now. Well, I can, you know, being in Alaska a long time, being in the timber industry, I can speak to that firsthand is that what they call it the, 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 the the Tongass Wars, the Timber Tongass Wars. Um, the environmentalists came and said, you know, little loggers, little sawmills, medium sawmills, we're not against you guys. We're against the big guys. And so you join us and, and you know, you'll have more timber for yourself. And uh, as soon as the big guys were gone, guess what happened? Then it was the medium guys against the small guys. Now there's nobody left. Mm. Um, they're gone. And that's what they did. They divided and conquered. Well, it's mm. like the number one rule of in the art of war, turned right? Divide on. and conquer. Yeah, yeah they yeah. turned everybody on each other. Yeah. So that's how it's been done through history. And when people don't recognize it, they're like, oh, well, yeah, we don't like the big guys either. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and well, that's, yeah it could be kind of what's going on with hunting because you mentioned the decline in, in licenses of 18 million to 16 right. million. Now, has that been like a steady decline? Does it kind of go up and down as. I thought, uh, I thought it spiked in like the. First year of COVID. This this is has been a, a year or two ago, and it's I don't know. It's just they just count all the licenses every five mm-hmm. years. Yeah. That's, okay. That's every five years. Yeah, yeah. What about the idea of expanding the the amount of permits given to youth? 
you know, because like my son, You're he's pretty been, limited, he, my, actually. it's pretty limited. And my son's been putting in since he's been 10, you know, and he's, he's about to be 12 and he's been putting in, he hasn't gotten one yet. But I think if there's more opportunities, like kind of shift some of those over to, to the youth hunts. Cause when you go with the youth hunt, it's not just a kid. You're bringing the entire family, you're bringing the mom, you're bringing the brother, you're bringing the sister. And so expanding that will allow that that love to grow in those children are and those the, families. Are the youth not allowed to apply for every I don't I don't know how the youth It's pretty limited. But I'm saying no, like no, no, like for can, example for example for oh, expand like the early youth like hunts, specialty period. specific yes. youth oh, hunts you, is what you, he's, you, he's saying. So for yeah. example, let's say the tier one uh, unit thirteen hunt they allow in the past it was like I don't know twenty two hundred or whatever. And there was only like, you know, two hundred youth. Why isn't it a thousand youth? and 1200 of the other ones you know because your family's still going to get that caribou but it's you're just relying and bringing the children out there t to harvest uh, the animal so mm -hmm. then you're kind of like breeding um you know that love for the culture and that love for hunting and it gives families opportunities to go out and do that because the time that we've gone out and we harvested a caribou with his daughter and mm. i'm bringing my entire family he's bringing his entire yeah, family all my kids thing, are going man. out yeah. and i would prefer personally i'd love that i'd love to see my kid or his kid or anyone's kid go out and get one um because that's just part of you know i've got mine i've already done it now the joy for me is to see you know someone else someone oh, else's yeah. kid or my own kid go out there and harvest that and then every time you're sitting down for dinner and like man you provided this you know and that's what's going to spark you know that love yeah for the future yeah and thanks. it's a it's an awesome thing like i mean you guys know you've heard me say it a million times i've the last two years i've shot one animal and it's the best two years of hunting i've had yeah you've been involved lots of big i've been on i've been on lots a, of big I've, game been kills. A, I've been on a lot of kills i just wasn't on the trigger i was helping and yep. it, it was it's been the best two years yeah, it's fulfilling. i mean minus this last week of leaving leaving two really nice moose and ship <laughs> creek drainage that wouldn't come out <laughs> of the trees <laughs> that's a little disappointing but other than that it's been i told rena tells like honey so um on saturday i might get a call from chad <laughs> 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 Might have to go just at least pack one quarter out, you know. <laughs> oh, well, John, what do you think about that idea? Well, I think oh. it's a great idea. I think that uh, yeah. the things you can do is you can uh, – one great thing about Alaska's uh, um, board of game regulation system is that you can propose anything at any time, and they consider it. Mm. And you can yeah. go testify. You can, you can submit it, and it goes in the record. They have to look at it, and you can, when it comes up, you can go tell them. This is why you want to do it. And I think that if more people, if in fact, even you put in one hunt and you had 20 people show up at Fish and Game, or at the Board of Game meeting and said, hey, this is something we really want to do, you know, there's probably a pretty good chance that the Board of Game is going to go along with it. But that's something you can do. Besides taking a youth hunting, those were all good things. Well, I think, I mean, that, that would even, you know, like the deal with the Brooks Range thing, like even if they cut it off to everyone except the youth, it still allows because I've been going up to that area that they closed for the last seven years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been lucky a few times and I had high hopes to take my son when I felt he was ready to go do that. And now obviously we can't because it's closed, but if they just would have switched it to youth only, you know, or, or that left, been the, awesome. left the youth opportunity because there was the first to the fifth um, option on harvest ticket in that area. Yeah, for youth, but that's that's all X and A, right? Like it's closed, right? Till yeah. further notice. Yeah, yeah. Except for subsistence. Mm. Yeah, lots of good ideas. Yeah, that works. Oh, that's good to paper. know, John. That we can. Yeah, that's where your guy or a group of people can make a difference. Can exactly. can propose something that they you know we feel in our hearts is in the best interest in the greater good of hunting in Alaska, right? The yeah. prolonging it, the the long game, because I think all this, and in the, in the groundwork that John and and SCI and and the Wild Sheep Foundation, all the <clears throat> groundwork is really only going to come to, like, it, it's all long game. Like it's all about the next generations that are going to come in after, gentlemen like you, you know, guys and gals have moved on, right? That are going to keep this thing going because. It's got to last, right? Exactly right. We've got to, people like us have to support that and yeah. look at the future. A lot of people don't look at the future of hunting. Right. Um, They're all looking at it right now, right? Like what's in front of them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, for that, everyone's look looking at, the at it from game. their own yeah. perspective. Yeah. And you, and and I think you're right. Like you made a really good point, and that's uh, that. Instead of just like switching areas, if that was your area, like you got to fight for it. And yeah. probably nobody knows that more than you. Actually, I mean. I've got, I've got a few fights. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, one really big one. <laughs> I mean, two big ones. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we could maybe transition to that. So, well, before we do, yeah. I, I got a, another SCI question. Mm. Do you guys um, keep track of um, members? Like, is there more youth members? Is there more uh, above 50 age members? Like women, age group? Kids? Is there SCI kids? You know, I don't know. I just know we have 650 members, and we try to encourage young people. Um, I, I'm sure our executive director, Lewis Cusack, could tell us that in a heartbeat, mm. but I don't know that myself. You can break okay. that down a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. yeah. 650, that's strong, though, right? That's good. That's good. Yeah, for Alaska. Is, is that as large as it's ever been? As far as memberships, um, uh, we've been doing that for a few years. Okay, yeah. it's been held pretty steady. Pretty, pretty yeah. steady. Okay, and for cool. a state like Alaska, that's we have one of the biggest chapters in the nation. Wow. Well, we are one of the biggest hunting states, even for being small population, right? Yeah, we got places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. People are whitetail yeah. hunters. There, <laughs> there's thousands of those, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's room to double. Triple Absolutely. the number of people that we're, are there. We're going to have to if we're going to survive hunting. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. We, we got to get more people in there. Yeah. Yep. For sure. And that and that starts with, you know, people our age, you know, um, people in mm -hmm. which were in our 40s and then and then letting the younger people in their 30s and 20s and those that are having kids, you know, become involved and let them know how important it is that to support to support these uh, people who are supporting us what, because the strength is in numbers. Yeah, would you would you say that maybe like I feel like the push maybe comes a little later in life for, for maybe most hunters as far as big game hunters because of the um, the time and experience, maybe the cost associated with, with the, um, the activity. Like for me, we were talking earlier about the sheep hunting and kind of like there's a little bit of a boom or a boost in popularity. Like for me, I've been a hunter since I was a teenager with my father, but I didn't get into sheep hunting until like 10 years ago. And that came later when I had more confidence as a hunter. I had more ability in the in the backcountry and in the woods on my own without my dad's um, oversight and, and, and finding trustworthy partners and, and guys that you're willing to go in the woods and do things with. Um, having a job where you can get away for a week or two and go do it and get PTO and, like, afford the gear and all the stuff to go. At. Like, to me, it, I was, a I guess, a late bloomer. Mm. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's that, is, am I, is there like a big group of us that are kind of in that, oh, I, I'm, in that I'm position? Late. I mean, I, I, mean, I hunted I, like small game as a kid a lot with my dad until, yeah. until my dad and I's relationship kind of dissolved. Yeah. And then that turned me off to hunting. And then I didn't start hunting until I was 30. Yeah. And that's what I mean by that. Like in my late twenties, early thirties is kind of when I started to find my groove in big game hunting. Well, that, like, that, that I leads wish I was to, doing it when I was like 18, 19 to 20, you know what I mean? Well, that leads to the cost, and that leads to also as, you know, when you're in your 20s, you know, you you have other things you're trying to get after, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're, you're out there point. chasing girls, and you're going to college and things like that, and you're saving your money for that type of thing, so maybe hunting and all that stuff is on the back burner. But there's some yeah. there's some, there's some some kids that are getting after it, and, and I, yeah, lo I love seeing that, you know, my... Uh, Young guys. I mean, you know JJ and Julie, and their son Riley is... Riley, that's all he does is hunt, man. All he does is get out there and hunt. And when I was just in Ship Creek, uh, the drainage, uh, you know, I was sitting in my sitting by my tent and glassing, and a uh, young kid rolled up on me by himself, and he he hiked the trail in from Eagle River. He came through Hunter Pass there, and he walked over, and he was like, you got moose tag? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'm just hunting black bear. I just didn't want to step on your toes. But I was like, oh, man, sit down, glass. Like, you, if I see a bear, I'll let you know. Yeah. And he was, he was hunting. He's like, yeah, I come pretty much every night. I just walk up here. He had his dog with him. and That's cool. And he had another buddy came. He's probably, I don't know, 23. It was awesome yeah. to see that. Just committed to it. Yeah. And then I, and I ran into those two uh, brown bear guys that had brown bear tags and they were from out of state. And, and they had told me some stuff that, you know, bummed me out and that, you know, they had 
the one guy had a bad experience with hunters up he went up in out of chicken and ran into a place that you know it had a sign said this is our camp we hunt it every year you know and so he, they like oh this is where they're going this was his plan he got there so he went and talked to them and was like hey you know how do, how do i stay out of your hair and he said that he was like those guys were like well there's like three valleys you know it was like three valleys coming together and he was like like you know if we hunt this valley we'll be in your hair and he's like we hunt that valley and he was like okay what about that drainage the guy's like we hunt that one he's like we hunt them all well that's like, what i'm talking it's like about. 100, that's what I'm 100 100 square about miles that, that this attitude of like this is this is my area this is my possession this is my spot you know that 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 deters yeah. and intimidates others from trying to find their own spot. And that's happening in a lot of places. Yeah. And it, it bummed I don't me know out. how to change that. I don't know how to change that. I understand people that have been going, like, I'm sure if some new guys rolled up to the spot where you guys have been going for 49 years, you'd be like, Hey, 52, you know, 50, <laughs> sorry, 52. <laughs> yeah, it's astonishing. You know, I mean, what, what, what would be your approach if, if some, oh, that's, some that's young happened, group came on? Happened many times. Yeah. And uh, we help them out. Do you? Uh, yeah, well, that's great, man. <laughs> river, the river we hunt on is just, it's full of rocks. Yeah, and uh, we know that if they're not experienced, uh, we're going to be rescuing them. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so we we help them out, and we've we've uh, helped a lot of people <laughs> back to the main river. But uh, you know, we tell them where we hunt, and plus we kind of know where all the moose spots are, and so we kind of feel we have a big advantage anyway. So we don't try to discourage people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great attitude. Yeah, and, that, and that's yeah. that's the type of people. And, and those guys were they. He was, you know, he was like, "Hey, man, like, honestly, he's like, I, I was pretty discouraged by it because he's like, you know, I went on another hunt and ran into the same problem, and you know, I, I ran into him, and they were like, you see anything?' And I was like, only across the valley, and, and they're like, oh, bear, and I was like, no, I have a moose tag, and they're like, oh, we have the bear tag, and I was like, oh, come here. Showed him a video of bear I just saw. Monster told him exactly too. where it was, and uh, he was like, "Man, like, what? There needs to be more of you in Alaska." And I was like, "Dude, there's more of me in Alaska than there is of what people. you ran into, man." Yeah, yeah. that's just a one-off. I was like, deal. I, "I was like, I'm sorry that you had that," and I and I it bums me out to hear that it discouraged you because I think you guy was from Wisconsin or Minnesota, and the other guy was, I think you know they're probably military guys. It just sucks that, you know, because, I, I mean, you guys, this is a podcast about Alaska. And, yeah. And, like, most of the people here are awesome. Yeah. 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 Let's yeah, take a quick break, positive. and I want to come back and talk about some of those battles that you fought okay. and won. <laughs> the Treehouse AK, your one-stop dispensary located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Be sure to ask the bud tender about their deal of the day because, honestly, there's always something good on deck. And, guys, listen, this is where the culture lives. At the Treehouse, their dedication to servicing consumers has been developed through a lifetime of involvement in the cannabis culture. They're committed to providing the highest quality products at whatever value your budget affords, while always maintaining the deep-rooted principles that have carried them this far. Their focus is on relationships over transactions, and you can always depend on them to treat you with the respect you deserve. Hit them up at thetreehouseak.com, and remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. Tailored Restoration, 24-hour emergency home services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Tailored has an emergency response number with trained professionals available to help you at any time, day or night. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Make an appointment today at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Since 2008, Serrano's is Anchorage's own new generation of Old Cocina. Their menu showcases the passion and love of their rich heritage and unique family recipes that have been passed down through the generations. Serrano's goal is to embrace and display trad flavors using the best ingredients that are available. They focus on making everything from scratch daily. In-house menu includes handcrafted corn tortillas, salsas, carne asada, and chorizo. But don't take their word for it. Experience their tradition and it's a bore for yourself. Locations on Tudor and Northern Lights, both with new tequila bars. Check out their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. 
The Connoisseur Lounge, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. The Connoisseur Lounge is Palmer's first locally owned and operated cannabis retailer. Their beautiful store is located at 226 Evergreen Avenue. The Connoisseur Lounge has exclusive cannabis products such as Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and one of our favorites, Sugar Cookies. And if you're not into the flower, the connoisseur can hook you up with edibles, vape supplies, and a ton of CBD options for all your health and inflammation needs. Check out their daily deals at theconnoisseurlounge.net, or even better, stop by the lounge today. Remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. Sounds like making up rules as they go type stuff right there. All right, so I want to jump into it. I, I, as we talked during the break, um, yeah. your your Supreme Court case, um, I, I, th- I think you you did correct me and said it's a navigable water deal, but I think the majority of people know it by the hovercraft case. Um, that's I don't know if people didn't really look into it. Um, that's obviously a a, a key word there yeah, because that's what you're doing. It first. I think the press kind of headlined that too. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, so so explain to us what you were just talking about and what 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 happened there. Well, the, the, I guess the that I was in a hovercraft and I was moose hunting, kind of had kind of a, a lot of press appeal, um, and so mm. they always mentioned the hovercraft. And in fact, I was buying my granddaughter a pair of boots at uh, Pro Bass um, on Saturday, and we're talking about her going hunting, and, um, and and the shoe salesman all of a sudden mentioned, "Do you ever hear about that guy in the hovercraft that went to Supreme Court?" <laughs> oh come on! I, mean, I didn't even mention it. You know, oh I, no way! <laughs> How random! <laughs> How <laughs> random! He my, had to know, right? My, my granddaughter just smiles and uh, says, "That was my grandpa," but it wasn't about the hovercraft. What the issue was, and to give a little history, is that when. When going back to the kings and queens of England and the emperors of Rome, that in those days the rivers, the tide lands, the lakes were their their interstate highways. There were their transportation routes, and so they had something called uh, uh, they put all those navigable waters in, in in tide lands into a public trust. And when our, the original thirteen colonies made the United States, they did the same thing. They said, okay. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to make sure that all our our lakes and rivers and tide lands are actually put into a public domain to be managed by the state, the states. And then when each state becomes a state, they automatically get title to all the navigable waters in the state. All the rivers, all the lakes, all the tide lands are owned by the state of Alaska. And the same in Montana and Wyoming, other places. So the issue was, is that I was hunting moose in my hovercraft just off the Yukon River, um, and, and uh, um, my hovercraft broke down, and some Park Service enforcement folks came um, and uh, started talking to me, really nice guys, um, and asking what the hovercraft did, and et cetera, et cetera. And then after about 20 minutes of pumping me for information, just like in the movies, they pull out this big book, and it's tabbed, and there's one sentence in a book that's about of regulations about two inches thick. One sentence says hovercrafts are not allowed in national parks and preserves. And so they said that uh, if I moved my hovercraft, I would get a citation. And I said, I don't think so. This is a navigable river, and it's owned by the state of Alaska. In fact, just as coincidence, the Nation River was actually a test case for navigability, one of the very first ones to find what a navigable river was. And so I knew it was owned by the state. And these enforcement guys said, well, you know, the state may own it, but uh, we manage it. And I said, I don't think so. And so uh, um, they said if I moved my hovercraft, I'd get a citation. So I had to get my jet boat up there and put it in my jet boat and take it back to, the, you know, the, my, my boat launch. But um, I got to thinking about that. Um, I said, you know, that's not right. You know, state, if you own something, they should manage it. And so um, I have to admit, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and I looked around for a couple, you know, for an attorney uh, that really understood the issue and uh, uh, ended up hiring two attorney firms. And um, I, first of all, I had no idea that I ended up in the Supreme Court. Although I have to admit, one of the attorneys I had, a gentleman by the name of, of Doug, um, Doug Pope, he's an attorney. And the very, very first meeting, he said, John, this is going to go to U.S. Supreme Court. And I thought to myself, yeah, right. No, yes. <laughs> no, no way. way. 
I mean, I <laughs> thought I want that. <laughs> I've never been in, I've never been in courts before. I, I thought this is going to be like you get a hearing and then you're done. And so anyway, I hired these attorneys and it's kind of like starting down a slide. I kind of couldn't get off of it. <laughs> so went to, I lost in district court. I lost in a ninth circuit court. And, um, uh, and I was not going to go on the Supreme court, but I had a group of native corporations and the Alaska Outdoor Council called me up, uh, completely opposite, you know, politically. They uh, uh, called me up and said, John, we want you to take this to the Supreme Court. We won't, we'll pay for it. And so they each gave me $30,000. Uh, we uh, submitted what they call a cert petition to the Supreme Court. And just to give you an idea that how tough that is, is that they take about like 0.2% of the cases presented. The year I went, there was 8,100 cases, and they took... 43. Wow. So the odds of even getting the Supreme Court are incredible. And so I said, yeah, we'll do it. And I, then I remember I got, a, I got a, a call from one of the guys I work with and said, John, they're taking your case. I was like, what? <laughs> and I, I was kind of dumbfounded. I had no idea what I was getting into. And so we um, did a cert petition, and we went there, and we actually got a unanimous decision. Although they said that there are some things that the, the Ninth Circuit should have answered, and then they didn't. So they remanded it back, some issues back to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit just was, I mean, the craziest decision you ever could think of. And, um, and so we said, well, we can't live with this. And so we, we did another cert petition. And um, I went to the Supreme Court. And lo and behold, got two unanimous decisions in the Supreme Court. And I think uh, the, the Washington Post did a story on it, and they, they, they did a research, and they said they've, there's never been a case, a civil case, that's got two unanimous decisions since the United States started. So it was pretty unique from that position. And to get a unanimous decision these days, especially against the federal government, is uh, pretty amazing. But the result was is that when rivers flow through federal ownership, the state of Alaska gets to manage them. They own the navigable waters. And the only exception is areas that were pre-statehood, like Denali National Park or mm. Glacier Bay, because those were not, those were federal designated areas prior to statehood. But anything that's after statehood is navigable waters, and there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles of uh, navigable rivers and, and, and lakes and stuff. And so now Alaskans, uh, even if, uh, the, you know, the, even the subsistence thing, if uh, um, the federal government closes the big area uh, for, for subsistence hunting only, um, if you can get in, a, like these rivers, you've seen like the Yukon is really wide. The customer, sure. You know, you, you can hunt on those rivers pretty easy for moose and caribou. Yeah. And those are owned by the state of Alaska. So you can land right in the middle of uh, federal ownership. We're on the uplands. You can't hunt, but you can hunt in that river because that's a state, as long as the state regulations say you can so that's what the case was all about, and um, uh, when it was all done, it cost about $1.6 million. Oh, and wow. No, I did not pay for all that. <laughs> um, when, I, when I very first uh, started, it was in the paper, the very first like the first week I put, filed my, my, my case, um, a, a gentleman by the name Ed Rasmussen um, uh, called me up and says, he was a fellow Rotarian, he says, John, I'd like to help you. And I says, well, I'd help with the the paying for it and so ed uh, uh from the very first bill i sent him my invoice he paid half of it all the way through and then we had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that donated money so i paid very little like they had a um, one of the things i'd like to talk about they had a the washington post came up after i won they had a big fundraiser up in fairbanks and uh, uh johnny binkley donated his paddle wheel i think we had about 350 people and they had an auction people would donate things and there was a guy from a small village out, uh, uh, out of Bethel somewhere, didn't have any cash, and he sent some furs. Mm. He sent a beaver wow. and a fox and a wolverine. He said, I have no money at all, but I'd like to give these furs to auction off. And so they even, that, he had no money, but he donated the furs that he had to help the case. It's awesome. And so yeah, he wanted to help. Yep, so Alaskans really got behind the case and uh so I, I don't call it my case i call it a true alaskan case yep. mm. i mean literally maybe even thousand people <coughs> donated um and then the outdoor organizations were all were very supportive alaska outdoor council wild sheep foundation safari club uh, they all donated money 
And uh, anyway, when we were done, like I said, it cost $1.6 million. And when I uh, had our last fundraiser, I had them send the money directly to our attorneys, and I got a check back for $231.51. All right. <laughs> well, now, I, I should tell you, in all honesty, that they, um, when you win a Supreme Court case, you actually get a, a, a – the Supreme Court sends you a check. Mm. And so from that $1.6 million, I got two checks – and so you have to deduct from one point six million dollars. You have to deduct six hundred dollars from that one point six million. That's the check they send you. Three hundred dollars each for winning a Supreme <laughs> Court case. Coming up. <laughs> were the attorneys that you hired Alaska attorneys? Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I mean, once you once you did the district in the Ninth Circuit, I mean, you must have been just like bummed, depressed, like this is over. Is that how you felt, or, or were your attorneys like? Letting you know, like, this is going to go further. Uh, the attorney said, I would be crazy to go on because they said your, your chances of the Supreme Court taking a case, like I mentioned earlier, are like 0.2%. Yeah. And uh, plus, this was a case that was sp specific to Alaska. You know, so Supreme Court cases, they're like, you know, uh, nationwide social issues like abortion, yeah. Yeah. Um, equal rights, and, and voting rights. And, um, and that they would take a case like this was even more extreme. And I don't know what the odds are of them taking it, but uh, it was it was pretty incredible. But uh, in the bottom line, Alaskans really, really won. And the thing about the, you probably haven't a chance to read the case, but if you do read it, it's it reads like a book. The Supreme Court talked about the history of Alaska. They talked about why the, when the Russians were here, and they talked about when Alaska became a state, we got a lot of resources so we can actually support ourselves. They talked about the fiery independence of Alaskans. In fact, they talked about, uh, um, the, I didn't realize this, but that uh, um, uh, there's an a, a old uh, town think, um, near uh, Valdez, it's, uh, I can't remember, uh, Cretel, I can't remember the name of it. Catala? Catala, Catala. And okay, anyway, trivia winner there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They, uh, 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 this is in, in Teddy Roosevelt's day, but they, they were bringing, they wouldn't let him use the local coal. They had to bring in coal from the lower 48. And uh, um, they, uh, uh, when it came in, they took all the coal, the locals, and dumped it in, in the, like the Boston Tea Party. Coal they, party. Coal party. Mm -hmm. And they talked about, and this is a Supreme Court case, they talked about when we were in, um, in, 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 when Jimmy Carter declared everything a national monument, there's like over 2,000 Alaskans went to the Nolly National Park, and they were going to uh, break one regulation a day. And they were there for a week protesting that everything was set aside in a national monument. Um, that was the precursor to Anilka and Angska. But uh, they mentioned the Supreme Court case at the very last day. There's a guy dressed up like Paul Revere, and he <laughs> rode a horse through all the people that were camped there and said, the feds are coming, the feds are coming. That was in the Supreme Court case. And the best best line in the whole the whole thing was the very last the last hearing, or the last opinion, and written by Elaine Kagan, Justice Elaine Kagan, which is still on the liberal side. Her very last sentence was, "Now, Mr. Sturgeon, rev that hovercraft up and go get that moose." Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. I tell my wife that all the time. I go moose hunting because I'm ordered to by the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> that's right. I gotta go, honey. I don't have I a choice. Go. <laughs> so if you guys out there just wrenching on the hovercraft. <laughs> so if you guys uh, got any problems with uh, wife's letting you go hunting, you just I'm gonna give her your number. Get a I'm gonna give her your case. <laughs> no, like just John to, said. <laughs> no, no, need the Supreme Court to say. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Just go to the Supreme said. Court and get him to put that one sentence in. You know, go go get a moose, Mr. Surgeon. So, so it's yeah. really just the principle. It kind of was. I didn't get a citation. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not about the hovercraft and it not being allowed in a national park and blah blah blah. It's just the principle fact of. Since the beginning of route travel on watershed way on waterway, this well, is a right. It was this is a given right. It was even more than that. The people mm. understand that Anilka, um, the Supreme Court said about at least seven or eight times, Alaska is different by law. Alaska is different by tradition. That the national parks, national wildlife refuges in Alaska are different than the lower 48. And they have to be managed differently. And the people up here have more privileges. You can use snow machines. You can use mm. motorized boats. Mm -hmm. You can hunt. You can fish. You can trap. And 
those are all things that within the ANILCA um, that that other parks and preserves don't have. And one of the things that they said is that one of the it was a the Supreme Court said it was a balance between preserving uh, you know pristine, beautiful areas, tradition, tradition, and also uh, balancing Alaska's lifestyle and our economy. It was a, mm. it was a, they, they, they went to a lot of emphasis by saying it was a balance between those two things. That's what Anilka was. And so, um, they, they, they emphasized that over and over again. And they said that, um, this case wouldn't go anywhere in the lower 48, but Alaska was different. And they said that over and over and over again. Unfortunately, the federal government still doesn't get it. I mean, they don't, they, they, um, they have an ILCA training, which, which tells the folks that work for the Park Service or, or the wildlife refuges or the national forest that they come up from Yosemite and other national parks, Glacier Bay. They come up here, and they can't conceive that a national park or national wildlife refuge, the things we can do up here. But that's what an ILCA was. It was the, they called, the, the Supreme Court called it the Grand Compromise. And so that's what the case was all about. It was, you know, sometimes I get a little frustrated when they say it's about the hovercraft and moose hunting. In fact, the, the, that gets the clicks, that gets the people's eyes. Yeah, but it, it was much more than that. And it, it, it defined, uh, uh, it reiterated the promises that were made in Nilka that Alaska is different, that Alaska was, the Nilka was to continue Alaska's traditions and lifestyles. And we're not like the people in lower 48. We hunt, we fish, we use the land. And plus, uh, when we became a state, that we were given 104 million acres of state land with the idea is that's going to support our economy. Uh, and it's not meant to be a park or preserve or refuge. It's for developing our economy, for our schools, for jobs, et cetera. And the Supreme Court got that. Not only they got it, but they got it unanimously. I mean, how many unanimous decisions yeah. come out of Supreme Court? None. None. Yeah, and so this was unanimous not once, but twice. And, and have Elaine Kagan... Um, I, I really respect that lady. She did an incredible job. John Roberts wrote the first one. Elaine Kagan wrote the second one. And um, like I said, you ever get to read it? It's like a history lesson of Alaska, history lesson Way of Anilka. Cool. Yeah, yeah. read it sometime. It, it, I'm going to do that. Yeah, it, for the people listening, I'm going to I'm going to post a link to that. I'm also going to post mm -hmm. a link to the Washington Post article, which is a nice little summary of it. And really quick, for those wondering what Anilka is, it's the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. Correct. That set aside national parks, preserves, and refuges across Alaska, but different than other 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 parks, preserves, and refuges in down in America. Yeah. Now, I wonder if um, other cases, I know a lot of times when there's a new case and they will go and reference um, a, a, a past case, um, I wonder if there's been other cases that have referenced your win Absolutely. in order for them to, you know, fight their battle. Have you heard of uh, the, um, uh, the bay, the, 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 um, the road at, uh, between Cold Bay and... Uh, is that oh is that uh, uh, uh King Cove uh, King Cove, yeah. Um, the, the um the King Cove uh, village just just won you know more steps ago, but they just won, and they referenced my case, and they, that's the example they use is that Alaska was supposed to, the, the, these refuges weren't supposed to be just for preserving, you know, uh, you know, uh, habitat or habitat. resources. It, it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a, a a compromise, and they used a quote from my case for rational. That's a Ninth Circuit. Um, why they could, they should be able to put this road through because it wasn't uh, you know the pushback was this is a area that's got to be there for wildlife and stuff but birds birds but they said that that's important but that's not what Anilka said they've been battling that for a long time right so they I got mean, I worked in King Cove seven or eight years ago and they were battling it yeah they were having to use like the most expensive hovercraft on the planet to get people in and out of King Cove so they could get access to medical and stuff because there's no way out of there well the battle's not over but at least the last battle in front of ninth circuit they use my case to say that you know this may be a wildlife refuge but it's 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 a it's supposed to be a compromise yeah we got to have some sort of we have to be able to access well plus it's you know also can you know it, it's continuing alaska's lifestyle yeah you know, yeah when i first got here to alaska um we hit people living all over the place i go down the yukon and there were people uh, homesteading everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different, uh, and, and those those are gone. Well, there, there's so many mm. cases of these, like, blanket federal 
mandates or laws that are put in place that, you know, they're decided by people in metropolitan areas. And if you haven't been to Alaska, you can't even comprehend like what it's like. Like, I mean, you can look, they can look, you, a person can look on a map all they want and go, yeah. well, it's oh, like it's looking like at Google Earth YouTube until you get like three times the size of <laughs> Texas. I mean, but they don't understand that like, well, it's like 95% private land and you have to be able to access stuff. And the only way we can, like, there's no road, like people don't realize that there's like three highways, you know, and they do, they do stuff. Like I remember a few years ago, we got into Nebesna and they had just, uh, they just made a thing in national parks, which you're in St. Elias when you're in Nebesna sheep hunting, you're in the preserve for the hunt. And, uh, they mandated that your food had to be in a bear proof container. And so, you know, Nate's uncle Cole called us and was like, Hey, you guys like, are you on the road yet? And we're like, yeah, we're just passing Palmer. And he's like, turn around. You need to go to like sportsman's warehouse and get one of those bear proof little keg things. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what? He's like, they have landed in a helicopter on three of my hunt camps yeah and wrote a ticket for not he and he and he's you know he was writing to them and saying talking to the federal agent up there and he's like this is ridiculous like these are sheep hunters like everything they do has to be lightweight like we're flying in in super cubs we can't take bear proof containers for food he's yeah. like they're gonna be walking out six miles with a sheep meat on their back like are they supposed to put that in a bear proof container like mm. this is absurd yeah. like this is meant for yellowstone yosemite yeah i understand that but you can't just blanket this and i don't know if it's gone away he's never brought it up again but we had to buy that dumb thing and i think we left it at the strip pretty much <laughs> and yes. just got it when we came back but i was like dude i'm not carrying that like <laughs> i'm not i'm not like you put it in your backpack. Well, like the people that want to go hiking up in Anwar, you know, they never hiked across <laughs> the tussocks. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. The tussocks about, you know, mm -hmm. two yeah. feet high. And it looks good luck like, with looks that. like grass. And then mm -hmm. you got, you stop for a second and, the, and you can't even see your hand because of the mosquitoes. And the <laughs> 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 Tape your ankles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Walking on a waterbed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Walking on bowling balls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> tussocks. So. How, how much was the original fine? I never got a citation. Oh, you never did. Did oh, they just? They, did, they didn't threaten you. With they told you you specific? couldn't move the hovercraft. Yeah. All right. So I, I didn't get a citation. This is also based on principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. It's probably was one of my bigger fundraising uh, advantages that that, that, that uh, well, you're just trying to beat a, a, a citation. I says no, I didn't get a citation. I didn't get a, a, a formal warning. I just got a verbal warning. Yeah. You know, so that's probably in the best things the Park Service did for me is that because I think it, my attitude would have been a lot different if I got like a five hundred dollar fine, and um, but you know you, you think of it a, a book that's two inches thick of regulations, government regulations, which you can't understand anyway. No, nope. one sentence: hovercrafts not allowed in national parks and preserves in this huge book, and it's not intuitive. If like I was uh, had my hovercraft and I had some extra gas and I was dumping it in the water or I was taking my chainsaw and cutting down a path somewhere, you kind of say that intuitively, yeah, that's probably something I shouldn't be doing, but driving a hovercraft down the Yukon River where there's been paddle wheelers and, you know, jet boats and everything in the world going down the Yukon. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that was uh, um, probably a big advantage I had, I think, for fun. At least for me it was. It made me a little easier to, for me to ask for, for money and to help people support the cause because I didn't get a citation. It was just strictly based on principle. What is the, um, when they say that navigable waters, is there a uh, distance on the outside edges of the water that's allowable? It's got to be well? the high water line. High right? water mark. High water mark. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Now, what about if you come across something that has been dried up? Does that that's end? Still, that's still, still it. high water mark. Still high water mark. Yeah, so if the water showed it went up to 20 feet on both sides of the bank up to where it yep. cut the soil down. Mm. High water line. Yeah, because yeah, I, I met a guy who had a buffalo tag floating the copper. <clears throat> Him and his wife floated the copper, got a buffalo on the river, like right on the edge, kind of where the high bank, like the bison was down on the bank, and then 
So it was like off the river by like, I want to say like 20 or 30 yards. And then beyond that was a, a high water mark line where obviously the river rages up at one point down the line. Yeah. And a, uh, a local, um, what is the officer that kind of regulates like a native corporation land? They call them security officers. There we go. Um was threatening them with a citation and because it's at no land. gonna pin them for it and he's like, "Well, dude, I'm 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 on the river. I, you can't get me for this. This is still the watershed. You." Can. So he ended up kind of just telling the guy to fuck off, and he harvested the bison and threw it in the boat, and they floated out. And the guy, you know, I'm reporting you this, that, and the other, and nothing came of it because, yeah. in all reality, the guy was trying to enforce something that was not valid, but. Mm. I could see, like, if you're not aware of that, like, you could maybe get intimidated or think, oh, well, shit, I, I, did, I did do something deter, wrong. Yeah. He's trying to deter him. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and that that kind of pisses me off. Well, because, like, who the hell are you to come down and enforce something that isn't legit? And, uh, you know, the guy's within his right. He even says in the regulations and everything where, you're, where it's okay, but... I guess what pisses me off is that for someone to come in and steal that that shine of the experience of what it was and what him and his wife did together and accomplished, and then you got this guy that kind of comes in and taints the whole damn thing with with his bullshit attitude on it. And I only heard one side of the story, of course. Sure, from the hunter. But it sounds but, like he, I mean, if he wasn't, in I've his heard right, stories multiple times. Probably time. would have been charged with something. Yeah, but it was just like you know, it was like. Would a guy feel like he's now got to go turn this thing in, like he broke the law or he did something wrong, and you know he was in his damn rights mm. to do it? I but. heard a I heard an example today on a I was just driving back. I was listening to a mediator podcast, and they were up here. They were driving in a van, like they're doing the podcast in the van while they're driving to go hunt in Alaska on moose hunt, and uh, they were just t- answering some questions from like listeners. And I got two guys wrote in that said they. Um, that Montana, I think it was Montana, and they upped uh, the moose tags for this area. And um, they got drawn. And uh, the na- a, a native representative sent out emails to all the people and said, hey, fish and game got this wrong. The numbers are not, their numbers are not correct. Please don't hunt this. And mm-hmm. so the guy was asking, like, what should I do? And Ronello was like. Who's the final say here? Ronello was like, if you can't trust your local fishing game biologist for the correct numbers, who are you going to trust? By law, they're the ones setting the precedent. He's like, I would hunt it not even no question asked i I would hunt it you guys should hunt it because they because the guys wrote in and they were like we kind of feel like we don't hunt this we'll never draw this again there's no way it was the first time they'd ever put in for it and they both got drawn they're like we'll never draw it again and so like you know you have a lot of those things where you know though you know they were saying if if all the hunters that got this tag hunt it there won't be enough left for us Mm. and those are all those are very those are very touchy subjects but yeah mm, Renella Renella didn't even have to contemplate it he was just like you got the tag hunt it yeah Yeah, I feel like because it's backed by statistical data and science at least to the best of their ability and who else is out there flying around doing aerial counts numbers keeping up on calves and, and following tagged animals and the whole thing and it's like who else do you trust? I mean, it's, well, a couple, again, a they, couple, they... A couple of the other guys in the van were like, you know, that. why don't you could... Your approach could be to say, okay, show me your numbers. Show me your data. Yeah. Show me, show yeah, me your why research. Are you, yeah. like, how, are, how are you... Why are your numbers different than theirs? Yeah. And I don't I don't think they always... Like, fishing game always gets the numbers right. Yeah, I don't know what's it's, suggesting it's that obvious. they like do, they, but... It's a damn near impossible job. I mean, I don't know how you fly around. Like, I'm looking out of the window every time I fly in a plane. I don't see that much. <laughs> yeah. No. You know, it'd be real hard to count. But, I mean, I that's why the agency and yeah. the departments in place and the professionals are trained and educated. 
Absolutely. And again, I, I'm sure we've all got a bulletin or a um, uh, announcement that they they mandate or state something that you're like, what the hell? And you're kind of getting your own little uproar over. Mm, but sure. maybe you don't agree with, but at the end of the day, I'd say for the greater good and overall outcome of what they're doing, it's it's for the best of the game and the fish and the yeah. and the count and we have we have to support what we're we allowed to, to harvest them, yeah right. i mean you just i guess i just say trust the process yeah and then roll with that well and, and, and on a, on a note of that because if you don't trust the process and you just do what you want like i was telling you this story about earlier ben's dad's property yep that these guys have gone into went through 200 acres of private land, went around a gate in a fat boy, went around a gate. Once you get off of their land, you're in state park. I'm pretty sure that has to be state park there. Mint, Mint Glacier and all that. It's Moose Creek. They took that fat boy in there. They shot three illegal moose. They got the fat boy stuck. They went out and got a D5 dozer came back, went around the gate, drove that through private property, putting the blade down a couple times. I've seen the photos. There is a 12 foot wide swath through his land, trying to get the fat boy out to cover their asses. Got that stuck. My understanding tried to bribe the person who found them back there, which is the son of the owner of the property. And, uh, you know, the company they work for that had that D5 dozer is owned by a native corporation. Mm. Like in my eyes, like this is the, that's the worst type of hunter out there. Yep. And so like, you know, fishing game has to account for that kind of crap. Yep. I and mean, these guys killed three illegal moose, like left the meat, hid the horns, like it's it's as it's as bad as it gets. And yeah, there's a dark side. I mean, and unfortunately, right? unfortunately, as much as you want to think it doesn't happen, I mean, I hunt as much as I possibly can, which is probably considered a lot. I've seen it a couple times where people got illegal shit and and didn't do the right thing. And and I have a friend who's no longer with me, who, you know, he he's accidentally shot an illegal moose and uh, he turned himself in he was home he, it was hanging in his garage he could have easily not done the right thing yeah because yeah. he got home at 2 30 in the morning after packing this thing out and uh you know he went the following morning before work to fishing game and turned the meat in turned himself in and he got fined and you know, it probably messed up his draw tags, but, you know. You did the, the right the, thing. Yeah, those are the type of things. Like, there is accidents. It happens a lot in sheep. I just talked with the um, the girls at the fishing game office in Glen Allen, and they said that they felt it was about 20% this year. Wow. Um, and I think that it was a real tough year for sheep hunting, and a lot of guys were pushing that and that was that, that was one of those things where nate and i talked a lot about it on that trip because we were hardly seeing sheep we didn't see one you in 60 miles of walking in eight days didn't see one you terrifying and i was we were talking about like how would how could we make it different so people aren't shooting something they think is a full curl it's obviously not eight years old because they're they're getting illegal sheep and and they're turning it in and they're doing the right thing in that part but still like how do we prevent it Keep from, happening? from like, pulling the trigger and, and, doing I, it. and i was suggesting that that whole new way of aging that it's mm -hmm. showed you guys like on the crown i i think like that i think the whole full curl thing almost needs to like i don't it almost needs to be an age thing to me but mm -hmm. that and, and i because i think you got to really look at something a lot harder to age it than to assume it's a full curl. Yeah. John, but I don't, but I don't have any, I don't have the answers, but I would hate for it to go away. That's all I know. Yeah. Well, 
I think that uh, anyone that's listening, the best way to uh, continue this this talk is become a part of SCI, become a membership, um, go go to the banquets, um, support with some of your money, support with some of your time. Um, I think the youth thing we should pursue that uh, right ADFNG um, about expanding those youth youth hunts because that's the future. Um, support the Wild Sheep Foundation, um, Alaska Outdoor Council, some of these other uh, companies that are uh, these teams that are doing all this positive positive things. And 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 thank you, John, for coming in and, and talking to us and and kind of shedding a little light on on your lifestyle and your life in Alaska and your battles and and all that. It's it's much appreciated. Um, I would like before we uh, end the show, I would love to hear a John Sturgeon cow moose call (laughs) 52 years in camp it's got to be pretty Uh, mean john no pressure though (laughs) actually probably a bull call would be a little bit better i think you're okay it's it's up to you yeah (laughs) we've always done cow calls yeah why don't we uh, switch it up a little bit There you all go. All right. All oh, right. Just a little gluck action. <laughs> it sounded little. like a legit recording of a bull moose right there. <laughs> that was good. It's That's on tape it's now, guys. Just take that and take it in the field and put on yep. a speaker. That can be you <laughs> if in 52 years of practice. <laughs> yeah, I bet in, the, in those years, man, you guys have seen all kinds of uh, moose activity, though, huh? As far as the. Two years we didn't get a moose. Only two years out of that you didn't get one. Oh. Wow, I'll be darned, man. Was that. Just rough, weren't rain years or or crappy winds or flooding or just yeah, some. We're, we're in jet boat, so okay. shallow water. Oh, water so access, rain, yeah. Rain, rain is good. Yeah, there so. it is. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Got to have water to run your jet, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, well, thank you for having me, and I enjoyed chatting with you. And hopefully, folks, you're motivated to get more involved in the hunting community. And there's lots of ways to do it. And and uh, we'll set up a time for you guys to put on a for people who want to go hunting for the first oh, time. Oh, we'd love that, John. And thank you yeah. for that offer. Yep. We'll, we'll you, certainly you take it. you up on that. You got it. It's going to be the Nina Center. Yep. Uh, the, the second week in February. Perfect. Well, perfect. Uh, uh, thank you for your service, first off, and thank yeah. you for standing up for just knowing that something was right. Because I think a yeah. lot of people nowadays don't do that enough. Just because it's just easier to turn the other cheek or yeah. like I don't have time for it or yeah. or whatever and my voice won't make a difference. And you never yeah. know exactly how important it could be. Like you just thought you were standing up for what was right and it went to the Supreme Court. Which is huge. Yep, twice. And now now Alaska can uh um, and plus it went farther than hunting it went on you know no, it was what, way what, beyond that. Yeah, yeah. What's the purpose of an ilka? What was the Anilka all about? It was a grand compromise. And Alaska, like I said, they said over and over and over again, Alaska is different by law. Alaska should be treated different by law. And the agencies must treat Alaska differently than the lower 48 because we are different in the laws that our state is founded on. Anilka and Inkska and our statehood compact are all different. It makes Alaska different. Yeah. Well, That's thank you, John, for what you my, what you did to shed light on that. Okay, my pleasure. Yeah. And thank you to sure. all those people that supported you in those yeah. organizations Absolutely, that stood man. behind you. It was that, a team that's effort, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that trapper. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> yeah, I made about two hundred $250 from his first. That's pretty good. There yeah, go. there we go, there man. Go. Oh, thank you Even very much. Even the little much. guy. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you awesome. Alaska, for listening. Support the podcast by uh, going to our website and uh, picking up a hoodie or something. Patreon.com slash Alaska Wild Project, SCI Alaska, Wild Sheep Foundation Alaska, Alaska Outdoor Council, any of these other things. We appreciate you listening. Thank you for listening. Stay wild. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your overcautiousness. Are you not overcautious? When you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Barney's Sports Chalet, supplying hunters with the best hand-selected gear since 1963. The exclusive home of Frontier Gear, built for the rugged Alaskan terrain. Your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Visit Barney's today at 906 West Northern Lights. Arbor Digital, the forefront of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and wealth management, providing a low-cost, research-based investment strategy for Alaskans looking to invest their hard-earned money. Visit arborcapital.io today to put your money to work. 
tailored restoration, 24 hour emergency home services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Total Truck and Alaska Overlander, Alaska's premier supplier for custom automotive accessories and overlanding products, providing all-inclusive rental vehicles and trailers custom outfitted to explore the Alaskan backcountry with a unique and convenient traveling experience. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. TheTreeHouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. The Connoisseur Lounge, Alaska's premier locally owned and operated cannabis retailer, located in the heart of Palmer, Alaska. Their cultivated products include Snowcap Romance, Aurora Haze, Super Glue, and much more. Find them at theconnoisseurlounge.net. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska. Built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation, with exclusive products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce cards, and more. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be happy forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. The Bait Shack. Located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Snow Pro AK, your snow and ice management company specializing in business and residential properties. They know what it takes to keep your property presentable and safe. Give them a call for a free estimate at 280-7098 or visit lawnproak.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off of Arctic and 58th, handcrafted Alaskan-made colonial ciders. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Stop by today and taste an award-winning cider. Should you not claim to be at least his equal in prowess and act upon the claim? I say try. If we never try, we shall never succeed. This proposition is a simple truth and is too important to be lost sight of for a moment. If we cannot beat the enemy where he now is, we never can. It is all easy if our troops march as well as the enemy, and it is unmanly to say they cannot do it.